All right, good evening, Placerville, and welcome to, to tonight's meeting of the City Council. Will everybody please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Again, good evening, everybody. Um, first off, I just want to say uh, welcome back to our city attorney. Uh, it's good to have you back uh, from leave and um, have you back up here with us. So thank you. All right. Uh, let's do roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Here. Councilmember Gottberg? Here. Vice Mayor No? Here. Mayor Saragossa? Here. Councilmember Yarbrough? Here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we will move on to a couple of ceremonial items that we have uh, this evening. Uh, and the first one is our Veterans Day proclamation. And I'm gonna go ahead and read that uh, into the record. And that is a proclamation of the city council of, oh, wrong one, we got two of them tonight. Let me get the right one. This is a proclamation of the city council of the city of Placerville commemorating Veterans Day 2023. Whereas the United States military is the strongest, most capable fighting force the world has ever known, the brave men and women of our Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard demonstrate a resolute spirit and unparalleled commitment to defending our nation and preserving the American way of life we hold sacred. And whereas Veterans Day began as Armistice Day, a holiday commemorating the end of World War I on November 11, 1918, and was established as a national holiday by presidential proclamation and congressional resolution in 1954. And whereas Veterans Day serves as an observance that commemorates our nation's thanks to all branches of the armed forces who have served at home and around the world. And whereas today our over 2 million veterans live in California, among them are men and women who served in World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, and our recent wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan, as, where, as well as various smaller engagements and peacetime deployments. And whereas it is the men and women of the United States Armed Forces, along with their families, that make immeasurable sacrifices on the battlefield and on the home front to defend our freedom and protect this great land. Now, therefore, I, Michael Saragossa, Mayor of the City of Placerville, do hereby proclaim November 11, 2023, as Veterans Day in the city of Placerville. I call upon the citizens of Placerville to express their thanks and gratitude to all veterans and their families, and I call upon this community to, be to begin with new resolve the task of building peace and freedom that will endure and honor the sacrifices of our veterans. And that is dated today. And I'll have the uh, honor of uh, also presenting this when we do our Veterans Day celebration uh, over at the Board of Supervisors Veterans Memorial. It's always a good event and uh, certainly would uh, uh, ask everyone, to, if they have the time, to please come on out as well. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do our second uh, proclamation this evening, and that is for the Extra Mile Day. Uh, and that is, again, is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Placerville de declaring November 1st, 2023, an extra mile day in the City of Placerville. And whereas the City of Placerville is a community which acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when an individual citizen collectively go the extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service, and whereas the city of Placerville is a community which encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas the city of Placerville is a community which ch chooses to shine a light on, the, on and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas the city of Placerville acknowledges the mission of Extra Mile America to create 550 Extra Mile cities in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2023. Now, therefore, I, Michael Saragossa, Mayor of the City of Placerville, do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2023 as Extra Mile Day. 
I urge everyone in the community to take the time on this day to not only go the extra mile in his or her own life, but to also acknowledge all those who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment and to make their organizations, families, community, country, or world a better place. And again, I, I, uh, Placerville has been doing this for a few years now and uh, I'm always uh, grateful that we have so many people in our community that do go the extra mile uh, and give of their time, uh, many in the, sitting in this room today. So again, thank you to our, our residents. Okay, uh, with that. Uh, Can we actually take, I'm sorry, public comment on those two? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. See, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Reminding me I'm, I've done wrong already. Uh, will there be any public comments on either of the proclamations, which are items 3.1 and 3.2? All right, seeing none, we will then uh, move to uh, item four, our closed session report, uh, none this evening. Uh, so we'll move to item five, uh, which is the adoption of the agenda. And I do think we have one um, uh, item that we wanted to hold over. Yeah, we'd request that you table item 7.6 and it will be brought back at a, a future date. So. Okay. So if we have a... I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda. Okay. With tabling 7.6. <laughs> A second. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clerici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Thank you. Uh, and just um, because it, it was listed, so if anyone, when we get to that item, um, you still will be able to make public comments on item 7.6. Uh, so I will move to the consent calendar now. Uh, consent calendar, all matters listed under the consent calendar. Oh, this is one of those one of those afternoons. Thank you. Uh, item six, announcements and presentations to the, to the public. And item 6.1, which are comments by the city council. Uh, and I'll start with council member Garbro. I have none for this evening. Uh, Vice mayor. I have nothing. Council member Clarici. I have none. Council Member Gottberg. I also have none. All right. Um, I'll go with none. <laughs> that way we'll, we'll keep this ball rolling. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, we'll move to item seven then, uh, which is the consent calendar. And all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion by roll call vote unless any member of the city council wishes to remove an item for discussion. And I know we go ahead and we table 7.6, but again, if anyone has any uh, comments on 7.6, we will still take those this evening. So I will go ahead and open up. The, well, first, is there any items that any council member wishes to pull or have comments on? All right, I will go ahead and open up public comment on the consent calendar. All right, seeing none, I will close public comment and bring back the consent calendar. I'll move the consent calendar and tabling item 7.6. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you, we have a first and a second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we will go ahead and move to the public comment uh, section of tonight, item eight for non-agendized items. Uh, this portion of the meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any matter not on the agenda and that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Uh, the mayor reserves the right to limit speakers' times to three minutes. Uh, you are not allowed to make personal attacks on individuals or make comments which are slanderous or which may invade an individual person's personal privacy. And we will go ahead and start with uh, item 8.1, uh, any oral communication. So if you have any, if you'd like to make comments on a non-agendized item, please come forward to the podium. Sure. Good evening, Mike. Good evening. Um, I'm just, I watch the Planning Commission videos from home, live stream on YouTube, fantastic service, but more often than not almost, they're not getting audio. So it's, it's kind of a failed 
It's just, it's the same room we're all in right now. It's the same equipment. I don't know what causes so many planning commission meetings to have no audio. So if somebody could fix that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll look into that. Sue Rodman, Placer of Fire Safe Council. I'd like to say the city and the goats have done a great job this year, and it's looking very good, and I hope they're not quite finished yet, are they? So keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. And does he want to talk? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Yes, hello. Uh, oh, wait a second here. <laughs> really? Wow. Good evening. Good evening. And my name is Michael Keene, and I have been a resident of El Dorado County since 1975. I have a BS in forest management and a master of science in watershed management. I was the forest hydrologist on the El Dorado from 1975 to 89. Uh, I am here today because a week ago I was inspired by Ken Burns' documentary, The American Buffalo. Among other things, the story showed how divergent interest groups and mortal enemies over a period of decades are able to save, were able to save the buffalo from extinction. Great things can happen when the forces of self-interest and basic humanity recognize their commonalities and come together for a common good. On September 28th of last year, I wrote a letter to the editor titled, A Glass Half Full or Broken, in response to a meeting of Forest Service retirees where the Washington, D.C. and regional offices of the Forest Service expounded the same old tired rhetoric. I challenged their business as usual glass half full of optimism and stated the glasses are broken and pointed out that the earth scientists, foresters, wildland firefighters, and others have been warning for decades that we are on an exponential path to an environmental catastrophe as happened with the Calder fire. We destroyed or killed most of the old growth habitat and the very threatened and endangered species the environmental groups were trying to save. In the steep and severely burned portions of the Caldor Fire area, we have lost a thousand years of soil formation, uh, thus reducing soil productivity and the ability of the forest to recover. It saddened me that there was not a single response to my letter. It appears that our public institutions are willing to go where the tax dollars are spending billions on tax to try to mitigate the damage rather than return millions of dollars to the taxpayers through enlightened management that emulate nature and the natural processes of physical, biological, and ecological uh, systems. Anyway, I want to convey that if this situation concerns you, please add your name to the National Wildfire Institute letter to Congress which is in the information I have given to the person over here. And if you have any questions, uh, my name is on there, and I have a phone number, and I'll be happy to answer anything you have. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I just want to follow up on uh, Mike's comments real quick. Um, I hope we, we had a little miscommunication, and if that letter did not make it into the packet, uh, Regina, for the City Council, that's my fault. I'll make sure that that letter gets to you guys. Uh, Cleve, I'd like you to possibly look at it and see if uh, we could bring it back and see if the city could uh, possibly sign on as a signer 
uh, in support of protecting our, our forestry. And um, there's a number of um, uh, agencies that have already signed on, and I think it would be uh, a nice addition to see the city of Placerville possibly support that. So if that letter's not in there, I'll make sure you guys get it. And if possible, Cleve, if you could look at it and see if possibly bring it back at a future city council to see if the city could be an official signer, I would appreciate that. So thank you guys. Thank you. Hi, Ruth Michelson, Merchant Downtown. On a lighter note, I wanted to talk about uh, the downtown events for just a moment. I know that you all don't really per se control that, um, but just I wanted to say that as a merchant, you know, we have this six months of a lot of events and then six months with none. We have the Christmas parade early December and then we don't have another event until early June when we have wagon train. And so everything is really clumped together um, in the fall. And so I would just like to um, suggest that with the work with uh, Terry Zeller, who's handling a lot and doing a great job, by the way, of our events downtown, that we spread these things out and have some of them come back to the spring and the summer. Uh, well, I just say we'd have one in June, but something in between December and June. Um, it's just better for keeping the interest in downtown and keeping visitors coming to Placerville. So I hope that in this coming year we can move towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close public comments for 8.1. Uh, Regina, do we have any uh, written comments? Eight. No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, Mike, we'll look into the uh, audio. I know there's some getting used to this, but oh, Cleve, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, we, we apologize. New system, we, we thought we worked out all the bugs and we obviously have not yet. We think we have the solution so that that should not happen again, uh, but we're still working with our uh, consultant, that the, the vendor that we worked with on this to make sure that it doesn't. But we think we know the fix now at least so that if it happens again, we can, we can fix it. So. Okay, good news. Thank you. Okay, uh, we did not pull any items. Uh, item nine, there were no items pulled from the consent calendar, uh, but we do have an ordinance uh, this evening, item 10, and item 10.1, uh, which is to consider introduction of an ordinance adding chapter 17 private sewer lateral ordinance to title seven of the Placerville Municipal Code. And Mr. Rivas has uh, this report for us this evening. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, uh, members of the council. I'm going to start with a little bit of the background. Um, much of the city was developed over the last half century or more, meaning that many of the existing private sewer services and private sewer laterals are utilizing inferior pipe materials or may have other structural defects that contribute to the release of sewage, which we call sanitary sewer overflows or SSOs into the environment, which can cause a threat to public health and the environment. Another problem is the contribution of INI, which stands for inflow and infiltration of the groundwater and stormwater into the city's collection system and into th these private uh, sewer systems. Uh, so the goal here is to keep our city clean, uh, reduce or eliminate health threats, and maintain the city's overall sewer system in compliance with the city's permit from the Central Valley uh, Regional uh, Quality Control District. Uh, the city also settled a previous uh, potential lawsuit with the California River Watch in 2016, and the city agreed to address its overall sewer collection system to reduce or eliminate sewer spills, which may eventually make its way to surface waters. Anytime there is an unintended release of sanitary sewage overflow into the environment, or an SSO, the event must be quantified and reported to the California Regional Water Quality Control Board. Over the past several year time frame, service requests and repairs related to private sewer laterals and private systems have accounted for almost double the repairs strictly tied 
to the public sewer collection system, which strains the workload of our public works division staff. So what are we currently doing? The city has been actively pursuing the use of code enforcement under Title VII, Chapter 4, the sewer regulations of the city code to address damage and failing private sewer systems when the repair or replacement of a private system becomes known to the city. Section 7-4-19 of the city code specifies the responsibilities of the property owner. In October of 2015, the city developed a standardized form letter that identifies the location, condition of the sewer system, and the citation of city code enforcement action. This procedure has been effective in pursuing private sewer lateral system issues on more of a reactive basis. And I emphasize reactive because the city becomes involved after an unfortunate event, which then can become an emergency situation. Then, when the city finds that a number of houses, homes, or units are served by a common uh, line, I will use the term here common sewer lateral, the city finds the property owners of interest having varying degrees of private ownership and responsibility. Violations and penalties are currently contained in City Code 7-4-20. The proposed private sewer lateral ordinance will become what staff believes more proactive and provide a greater level of protection to the city's sewer system, the environment, and public health and safety. Rather than wait until a sewer spill or private system failure, the proposed ordinance seeks to cause specified triggers that would initiate the testing and inspection of private systems to determine their integrity thus reducing future common sewer lateral failures. This private sewer lateral ordinance establishes regulations and enforcement for inspection, testing, repair, replacement, and ongoing maintenance of private sewer laterals, or PSLs, resulting in the issuance of what we're gonna call a Certificate of Lateral Compliance, or COLC. So what does this ordinance apply to? This ordinance will apply to all private sewer laterals and private sewer service connections that will ultimately connect to the city's public sewer collection system located either within the city of Placerville or located within unincorporated areas of El Dorado County that happen to be served by the city's municipal sewer collection system. So what does this ordinance require? The ordinance requires a certificate of lateral compliance which initiates any repairs or replacements, if necessary, to bring uh, the private sewer lateral into compliance with the California Plumbing Code. So I'm gonna go over some of these triggers. So some of the triggers will be one, before completing a title transfer of a parcel containing any structure with a sewer service connected shall attain a COLC unless the property already has one or the private sewer lateral or private sewer system is less than 20 years old, or a time extension request has been granted. Two, whenever the property containing one or more structure is subdivided, the PSL serving the property shall be tested. Three, whenever the property is remodeled, that would include the addition of two or more plumbing fixtures. Four, Whenever a property owner submits an application for the construction or building permit for the remodel of a structure and the cost of which equals or exceeds 25% of the market value of the structure. Five, upon the repair or replacement of a portion of the private sewer service or private sewer lateral. And six, following a sewer spill or a complaint and the city determines that the cleaning, testing, repair, and replacement of the sewer lateral or private system is required. And then seven, where the private sewer lateral was installed without permit and does not possess a COLC. So this ordinance has been before the council um, a few times in the past already. It was before the council on January 9th of uh, 2018. That was the first reading. Uh, then again on August 9th of, of 2022 for first reading. And to the conclusion of that meeting, uh, the council directed staff to hold a public workshop, which was held on May 24th of this year, 
It was well attended workshop uh, conducted here in town hall, and all property owners uh, that were that are currently known to be served by a private common lateral were invited to attend by mail. Uh, some modifications have been made to the ordinance since it was first last before the council, primarily the deletion of 7-17-8. That was a section that required or owners uh, served by a private common sewer lateral to enter into a private sewer maintenance agreement. And the city uh, determined that the city is not able to legally obligate the owners of a common uh, sewer lateral to enter into such an agreement. Uh, numerous other changes were made, clarifying the ordinances as shown in your copy by underline and strikeout. Uh, issues raised during that workshop primarily was the sale of property triggering the need for a certificate of lateral compliance. And this is a means of being more proactive rather than waiting for a substandard sewer piping to fail and spill. So staff does feel that a new property owner would want to know the condition of the sewer lateral just the same as that new owner would want to know the condition of the roof or whether the house has termites. The public was also concerned about the city staff having access to private property without their permission. Uh, staff would not enter private property unless permission were granted or unless it was an active spill. And in this case, city staff has to enter and try and uh, stop the spill of uh, sewage into the environment. So overall, the general reaction uh, to having the ordinance in the first place um, is thought of being sort of a heavy burden. The ordinance meant to reduce sewer spills and reduce uh, inflow and infiltration into, into the city's uh, public sewer system and not overburden our wastewater treatment plant. In a perfect world, the sewer system contains only wastewater, no rain, and no groundwater. The public was also concerned with the cost burden for repairs. We emphasize that the private sewer laterals are privately owned and not the part of the city's collection system. The ordinance does make it clear that all owners of private laterals are jointly and severally responsible for the repairs, not just the property owner that happens to be at the bottom of the hill. So a couple of corrections I want to just note, um, and again, we apologize for this, but we did make some changes where some of the numbering changed. Um, but the reference in section 7-176A, uh, we're changing the reference from 717-12 uh, to 717-11. And then uh, in section 7-177A1, uh, we're changing the reference there from 717.7 to 717-6. Uh, so with that, um, staff is making a recommendation to the council that you introduce and waive the first reading of an ordinance amending Title VII of the Placerville Municipal Code, the Health and Sanitation section, adding Chapter 17 entitled Private Sewer Lateral Ordinance to the City Code. Uh, that concludes staff's report. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Okay, great. Thank you, Pierre. Um, I'm guessing there's going to be questions. Um, so I will, who would like to go start? All right, Mr. Clarici. Okay. Um, you mentioned that um, this, uh, the, the acronym for your certificate thing, uh, less than 20 years old. Um, are there a lot of these? I mean, I'm, are these, um, do these happen nowadays or even in the last 10 or 15 years? Or is this really sort of an artifact from a, a while ago? I guess with respect to the, to the time involved, we originally had 10 years uh, before the city was going to require then. You have to right. reissue, the city would reissue your certificate right. of compliance. So. Following the, the workshop and meetings that we had personally with some residents, uh, and we also researched some of the longevity of the new piping materials, yeah. and that's opposed to, say, Orangeburg or uh, cast iron. Um, the new plastic piping can last, you know, 50, sometimes 100 years. Right. So we, we, changed, we changed it to 20 years. Okay. Um, in my consultation with our uh, building official, he felt that 20 years was reasonable because within that time you can still have roots, breakage, issues right. can happen. And so right. 20 years, uh, we felt, staff felt, was, was a good compromise <clears throat> as far as somebody that either just put in a system under permit 
and they're within 20 years, or they 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 uh, receive a certificate of lateral compliance, right. and it's good for 20 years, okay. unless of course something else happens in between. That's that. Okay, fine. Thank you. Also, um, and I I usually try to let you know if I'm going to ask a, a, a question like this one, but I didn't. Um, uh, INIF. Okay, can you um, and very without round numbers. How much um, effluent does the city sewer, you know, the, the treatment plant, handle on any given day? Just an average number. What is that number? I'm going to refer this to our. Thank you very much. Okay. I right. do not have those <laughs> specific fingers. Okay. Figures right. on the. I mean, I kind of know what the number is, but I'd like to hear it from a professional. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the amount of um, treatment that we do on a daily basis is around 0.9 million gallons per day. Okay. Um, during this past storm event on Sunday, we yeah. jumped up to 1.2. We received right. about 1.8 inches out at the plant. So that's just because of the system and it's this issue that we're talking, partially this issue we're talking about today, there's other things that cause INIF as well. Yes. But partially because of this issue as well. Yes. And when it gets really bad, how much is headed toward the sewage treatment plant? Like when we have a large storm event. Um, during the 350 year storm that occurred on New Year's Eve, we had about 10 million gallons. Yes. From 0.9. Right. And, uh, you know, just kind of attributing to the work that we've been doing out there to maintain our plant, we fared a lot better than we right. had in previous years, but we did have an SSO at that point as well. Right. Okay. Because I think it's important for the public, if they don't know this, to know that this issue of what gets into the sewer system and then ends up going through our expensive sewage treatment plant is not something that we're just sort of talking about that isn't a real issue. It's a very, it's a big issue. And it, whether this measure is done or some form of it, getting, getting the holes in the system plugged is really critical because the challenge is everybody ends up paying for this over time. And so uh, I wanted to, um, I just wanted to make, I wanted folks to hear those numbers. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? I do have, um, I have a question, I guess, Pierre, I guess an example. I'm trying, because, and you brought it up actually yourself when you said, you know, not just the person at the, at the bottom of the hill, but so if you're on a, what's it called? Um, like a private sewer lateral, where it's multiple play, multiple homes or business, co private and common lateral. So you have your house for sale. Say you're on the, the top house, um, and there's problems, you know, with the Orangeburg eight houses down. So there's, you know, eight houses that are affected by that. Um, how does that work out in real life in terms of, I mean, you can go and knock on the door of eight of your neighbors and ask them to pony up their fair share of the amount, but whether they have the money or whether they um, they don't, uh, they can't afford to do anything. Um, how does that, I mean, would that affect, I mean, would you just be stuck and not be able to sell your property because you wouldn't be able to, I mean, you might be able to, to pay for your own line that gets to the to lateral to the. But w what do you do for the rest of them that can't do it? So let's just say, for example, then that that owner at the top wants to sell his house, and there is no certificate of lateral compliance, and we require then that owner to camera the line, and we determine the line is in Orangeburg or, you know, a pipe with no bottom kind of a thing. Well, that pipe will have to be replaced. Uh, but in order to allow an escrow to close, we can grant a 180-day extension. That's what's currently in the code. So then a new property owner, then the buyer and seller could negotiate maybe with the cost of what that might be, depending upon what their fair share would be to replace that line, something of that nature. Because our hope would be that there's a, um, a sewer maintenance agreement in place and so all the owners know that they're um, equally, severably, jointly liable for the cost of replacing that line. Because in, in reality, they are, even though they don't have a maintenance agreement. Because um, we have run into that, um, that situation uh, more recently. There was a, 
a line on, I think it was on Lewis Street that was replaced and it served a number of houses. And I think fortunately we had a former council member that uh, knew the property owner and worked to facilitate um, the uh, repair and replacement of that line and everybody contributed. At least that's my understanding that that was successful. But if they're gonna battle it out and people refuse to comply, well then that's where maybe they'll, they'll have to go to a, a court or something like that and get that resolved at that, that action. Or if the city has the money, depending upon the threat and the environment, the city could do the work, which is in our, that other section of the code that I read to you in my staff, opening staff report, and then lien the properties for that cost. Gotcha. I mean, I, I have a, I have a problem with that. Only, I mean, we're in a. I mean, even in a good a good economy, buying and selling a house, you know, is not a necessarily an easy endeavor to do. And saying that we would have 180 days to cure such an example, which is not necessarily crazy example because these things exist. Um, I mean, that seller or buyer are probably going somewhere else um, because it's just too hard to figure out and, you know, there's other places on the market. Um, I mean, this is not a, this is not a seller's market necessarily. Um, that's why I think there's some real problems with that in us basically becoming a cog in the wheel, if you will, of a real estate transaction. I personally do not want to be in the business of saying yay or nay to real estate transactions as a city uh, and putting our thumb on that, even though I understand the goal of getting I&I &I out and, and other contaminants out of our, our water stream. Um, but I, I don't know if this is the best way to, to do that. Um, and, and, and I don't know how it would actually work in real life either. Um, you know, this, do these things just go underground? And I'm also wondering what type of feedback, if any, did we get from the real estate community? And did we do any outreach to the real estate community on, on this? Uh, we just primarily invited those that we knew were on the private systems, not specifically to the real estate industry. But this was probably one of the more contentious items in the ordinance was the requirement to have a um, COLC with transfer of title on property. Understood. Yeah. Thank you. I have a, another follow, kind of a follow up to that. I recall uh, on my uh, on my first um, go around on the island that um, we had a similar ordinance that we passed. I believe we passed it, but it was not for multiple laterals, but like just you, you own a house. The pipe goes into the sewer, and even then, we were having the same kinds of issues. People have problems, breaks on their on on their property, on private property. Um, the crews get called. We end up going out there. I forget, the number at the time was like sixty percent of our calls on sewer calls were on private property. And if I remember correctly, we did pass something that had that issue in it though where when you transferred title or or did that ever get passed i'm it might have been a thing while i was there and then it didn't get passed or is this part of that yeah help me out here. yes um we we sort of had a little confab here that's fine um, that's why i'm asking we feel you're probably referring to this ordinance to this ordinance and it just yes. never saw it oh never golly because it first went before you in uh 2018. yeah okay and so, so that would have been that year okay great in there so i think that's what it was all right then so okay for some reason i thought it got done i guess not okay any other questions or comments at this yeah so um I've, I've, in the real estate business, um, mortgages, real estate, construction, I, I see a ton of holes with this, not just holding up sales, but at that point, I mean, you hold up a sale for that kind of reason because three houses down is refusing to fix a problem or be a part of, of the solution to help fix the problem so that person can sell their house. Now, not only are you getting neighbors into lawsuits, but now you've got people probably trying to come after us 
for this kind of issue because now it's devaluing the value of their property at this point. And not and, and I'm talking about a seller who actually is trying to make a profit, not to mention a seller who needs to sell because of a death in the family who has no money to actually go after any of this stuff or be able to fix it. Um, yes, it is definitely buyer beware in the real estate industry. It is up to the buyer to make sure that uh, the sewage system is intact. Um, I mean, one of the inspections that is hopefully always done, but it doesn't always happen, depends on the buyer and whether or not they want to spend the money, is actually scoping the sewer lines. Now, even you call somebody out to scope a sewer line, they only go so far. They try to go to you know, where it connects with the city just to make sure that there's no issues. And if there is an issue, it's at least on the city side. But if you have a long distance, it's not always possible. I mean, most of these sewer scopes, you can get 250, maybe 300 feet. But if you're crossing property lines that are significant distance, um, then you've got another problem there because then that person is not going to be able to see all the way down to the city connection. And then the next part is what if you're crossing bare land? Um, it may not have any neighbors other than possible property owners that could be what we call absentee property owners. So now you're trying to deal with somebody possibly in another state, possibly in another county, or you're dealing with some sort of trust and now you've got a whole nother can of worms. So yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, Mayor Saragosa on this one when it comes to us getting into being the thumb of whether or not a real estate transaction can go through due to a repair issue. I think we're just opening up a can of worms on this one. Any other comments at this point? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up public comments on uh, Ordinance uh, 10.1. Mr. Mayor, I would just like to briefly mention that three items of written communication have been provided to the City Council, copies of which are on the back table for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Appreciate that. Please, if you like, yes. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Jim Copeland. I uh, live on Bush Court, which has a common sewer lateral. Uh, comments regarding the ordinance. The, it seems to me the first person to sell a home on a private sewer lateral faces a potentially huge expenditure to get a CLC. That could then possibly benefit other owners on the same line, including those who are opposed to sharing that expense. Is this fair? Conversely, are neighbors responsible for paying for a COLC uh, so that one family can sell their home? Is that fair? The sewer line ordinance could effectively prevent the closing of a home, which you've alluded to, uh, when a buyer reviews the extensive ordinance conditions. Could the ordinance reach the point of being considered inverse condemnation and illegal taking of the use and enjoyment of private property? especially if other adjacent owners begin losing buyers for the same reason. The probability of total neighbor cooperation in complying with the new sewer line ordinance on older lines is questionable. Over my last 44 years in construction and real estate business, I've seen situations where a person, excuse me, I'm nervous, uh, who benefits the most from a neighborhood maintenance agreement can be the one who most opposes such an action. I foresee the real prospect of this ordinance inflaming neighbor relations. Prior to approving the final parcel maps that created eight residential lots on Bush Court, where I live, the city required that a private sewer line maintenance agreement be executed by the developer, Roy Carter Homes. The private sewer line lateral system was engineered by Earl McGuire, city uh, civil engineer, and approved by the city. Each of the eight homes that were subsequently built were required to install a septic tank and a grinder pump to liquefy waste and pump it into the sewer lateral and up the grade of Bush Court to the uh, six inch gravity line at, on Maureen Drive. Each home to be constructed was required to install a backflow preventer between the individual home septic slash grinder pump system and its connection to the sewer lateral. The sewer line lateral and connection stubs were installed and completed by Doug Veerkamp Civil Engineering pursuant to the city approved engineered design. The completed work was signed off by the city. The developer then presented the city staff with a draft of the mandated private sewer line maintenance agreement for Bush Court, 
which the city approved and was then recorded with the El Dorado County recorder. The final parcel maps creating the eight lots were approved by the city and were recorded on August 28, 1992, and home construction began shortly after. Bush Court has a recorded document referencing our sewer maintenance fund that currently provides for an annual assessment of $300 per home per year. In short, the Bush Court lateral sewer line was professionally designed, it was approved by the city, installed by a reputable local contractor, and was inspected and finalized by the city. Because our maintenance agreement is a matter of public record, any new home buyers are made aware of such encumbrances in standard preliminary title reports issued by uh, escrow companies during escrow. This assures complete disclosure of the presence of the private sewer line, its maintenance requirements, and required annual assessments. Because of these facts, I'm asking that Bush Court homeowners be granted an exemption from this proposed city ordinance and that previously mandated conditions and agreements be honored by the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Sue Rodman, city resident and member of the Major h and Committee. I am glad to see this ordinance. It is much improved from the original. As a longtime member of the Major HL Committee, I am aware of the problems caused for the city wastewater treatment from problems with private sewer laterals. The city wastewater treatment plan is perhaps the city's most valuable and expensive asset. All of us, as customers of this treatment plant, have an interest in keeping it in good working condition. We also have a responsibility to protect public health and safety by preventing sewer spills on our property. It seems to be a common sense ordinance to protect city infrastructure and the public. And 20 years is a much more reasonable time frame than the original 10 year that was in the original. I do have a few questions. My home was built in 1987 and I purchased the property in 1998. The pipe materials are six inch PVC plastic with clean outs that conform to this ordinance. I have never had a problem with the sewer line, no known blockage, leaks or spills, but it also has no documentation of its condition. Not when I bought it and not since. Since it has no current certificate of lateral compliance and is more than 20 years old, how soon do I need to comply with this ordinance? May I have a qualified plumbing company do a camera evaluation to determine the condition of that sewer line? If they find the line is intact with no leaks or blocks or problems in that evaluation, will that qualify for a certificate of compliance? If they find the line is not up to city standards in this ordinance, I will get it repaired or replaced. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mindy Durand. I'm also living on Bush Court with my husband and several of my neighbors who are here. Um, thank you for hearing the concerns of the Bush Court residents who we feel have been a leader in this city in showing concern for the water system by establishing a continuous fund for our potential sewer repairs. On May 23rd of this year at the workshop, we and others stated concerns with the proposed ordinance. We listened to your staff. Responsibly, two weeks later, the Bush Court residents came to a decision to increase our shared Bush Court fund contributions. I hope the council is listening to us tonight. Mr. Copeland has spoken to the major concerns of the Bush Court residents who, by the way, 75% are senior citizens and or retirees. But I, I did read sections that have confused or concerned me. The first page of the ordinance states that in 1998, a test was performed by the city that determined most of the INI originates from failing private sewer laterals and systems. Most is not a number and it's not a percentage. I did hear Mr. Clarice mention a percentage 
Uh, that was my question. What was the number? What were the areas that were tested and failed? Um, we don't know. We don't have this data. Um, section 717, pardon me, 717, 7A3 requires homeowners to replace their uh, sewer laterals in its entirety. The next section, A4, states that non-residential structures may be allowed to make partial repairs determined by a building official. Uh, that confuses me. It seems like a difference, and I don't understand why. Uh, another section in enforcement states that people must respond and act on city notices of violations within 30 and 90 days, respectively, from the date of mailing. All legal documents that I've ever sent or received have been certified or registered mail. I love the local post office, but they do make mistakes occasionally. I believe this needs to be changed to say received in 30 to 90 days as shown by certified mail. As I said, with 75% of the street being retirees, we do often leave to visit far away family and we are out of the area. Section D. Um, speaks to revoking a certification, but it doesn't state uh, where and if a, a building official had signed off previously on the uh, PSL and when. If that should enter into the situation, what kind of reimbursement or credit would be given to the homeowner? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. I forgot to say Ryan Carter earlier. Speaking tonight uh, as a private citizen only in no official capacity. So uh, first I'll start by uh, stating it's important to recognize that there are no other jurisdictions locally in our county or in any surrounding county that has anything even approaching the requirements of this ordinance. Uh, that's why staff had to go to the City of Richmond, East Bay Municipal District, the Bay Area, to find us. Uh, you know, the, the basis for this ordinance. So that's important to note that uh, just getting started. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of areas of this ordinance that I find particularly egregious. I uh, appreciate if you guys would follow along. The first one being on page nine of the draft ordinance that was given to the public. It's the last item or second to last item on the definition, the verification inspection. A CCTV inspection witnessed by the building official to verify that all PSLs associated. Uh, so this writing to me says that the building and special, building inspect, inspector, pardon me, building official must be there to witness the inspection. That wording definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, that is a huge burden on city staff. They're not gonna send a, a building uh, an official out to be present to witness every inspection of every lateral. Um, so that's on page nine, verification inspection. The next one is on page 11, item number three, under 717-6. This is the one that addresses the, um, it's to trigger for the requirements and it's regarding the alterations uh, to include two or more plumbing fixtures. Um, the wording on this needs to be cleaned up. Um, this could easily be construed to mean that um, if you do a, um, an not, not even an addition, but a remodel and replace two fixtures in your house, that, that would trigger this COLC requirement. This wording needs to be uh, cleaned up uh, to make sure that it's clearly the addition of new non-existing um, plumbing fixtures. The next one is on the next page, page 12. The draft ordinance that was provided to the public has a different number seven than uh, what uh, Mr. Rivas uh, read to you guys. Um, on page 12 of the draft that was provided to the public, number seven is where the PSL was installed more than 20 years ago and does not have a current COLC, the property owner shall comply with the standards set forth in section 17, sorry, 7177. This clearly requires every single property within city limits that's more than 20 years old to get a COLC now. Um, if that was removed, then that was not provided to the public, but number seven needs to be addressed because every single property in the city will, that's more than 20 years old will be subject to this ordinance immediately under its current writing. Um, 12. Next, as was addressed by uh, this lady right here, 
Item number three, oh geez, I was fast. Um, the difference in the um, enforcement between uh, residential structures, a residential structure, if there's any deficiency, is required on item number three to replace the PSL in its entirety. They cannot repair it. That needs to be changed. Commercial uh, buildings are allowed to repair and uh, uh, residential buildings are not. That is onerous, that's ridiculous. Um, anyway, there's a lot, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. This needs to be continued off calendar until there's some changes. It needs to come back to another public meeting. There's been so many changes. This is ridiculous, onerous, and yeah, just don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Ruth Carter, City of Placerville and local real estate broker. As <clears throat> this current ordinance is written, I feel that it is um, punitive and onerous to the current ownership as um, was pointed out um, in those particular um, items in the ordinance. So I wanna point out a couple of things. Um, while the spirit is to prevent uh, environmental disasters, and we all want that, nobody wants to have sewage leaking into our rivers and um, elsewhere. So, but there's there's financial burdens um, to consider. Um, there are a lot of people, homeowners, again, as this is written, it, it makes it seem as if everybody over 20 years old needs to get the COLC. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people living on fixed incomes. There are a lot of people that can't nearly replace a full sewer line. Um, I have a home in West Sacramento right now that has our wonderful Orangeburg pipe. And I just got a quote for $16,000 to replace all of that piping and it goes through the neighbor's yard. And she has to replace it as part of her sale. Um, I got another quote that was 8,500 and that was the cheapest quote that we got. So this is onerous, this is punitive. This is something that really needs to be thought through. Um, you do have unpredictable costs when you scope a sewer line. Many times, oftentimes, it could be hydro jetted. There could be a liner put in a line. There are alternatives for repair, not just replacement. Um, and I would urge the council to be um, considerate of that, um, especially given that they're, you know, the commercial properties are being given the latitude to repair instead of replace. Um, so it's a disproportionate impact to our homeowners. Uh, limited uh, environmental benefit to enforce this for every single homeowner. I think a big key is education. Maybe it's something that could be a city advisory that's put out to all of the homeowners as well as a part of education. You know, maybe we encourage people to get scopes because anybody that gets a bad scope when they're purchasing a home, I'm gonna tell you right now, they want it fixed. Um, it's a little government overreachy if you ask me. I know you didn't, but I'm giving you my opinion because this is my time. Um, we do have some alternatives to achieve the same goal, create some financial incentives, subsidize inspections, public awareness, collaborative programs, community workshops. Let's work together for something that makes sense as this is written and is punitive and onerous. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. <clears throat> Good evening, Kirk Smith. Um, this matter has been before you at least three times before. And on the last occasion, you unanimously decided you needed to make sure that the public, those who were affected, would know. So you directed that there be notice sent to those homes. Secondly, that there be a public workshop so we could ask questions and get some important answers. This is not the same measure as you've already heard. There's some dramatic changes. It's more than 80 homes, more than 80 sewer lines. Um, one of the questions I asked was, um, how are you gonna get, assuming we could identify all 10 homes who are on this private sewer line, how are we gonna be able to get it enforced, uh, this private agreement? And the answer was with a smile, Mr. Smith, you're a lawyer, you can answer that. No, I can't. And by the way, you've now learned tonight and in the report, you can't. So what, are you good, what kind of mechanisms are you gonna come up with? Let me describe, just as our neighbors have described one problem in their area. I'm on a private collateral sewer line that runs from Big Cut Road to the top of Sacramento Hill. It's about 1,400 linear feet according to Google. 
That's the distance easily between the Druids Monument and uh, the courthouse. The other question we asked was, we want to know who are the other people on it, because you had two different lists that were given for our line, and they're not the same. But what we, if you have to imagine what it'd be like to trench that distance. It's not 180 days. So the last time this was up at a workshop, I called Comforti and asked them about estimates. No way. They wouldn't touch it. They don't do this. We're not talking about a plumber out of your phone book. There's only three plumbers or construction companies that would do that kind of trenching. Uh, Beer Camp is one. So it's not something you could do in 180 days if you're put on the spot. Um, you need to have it continued and do another workshop. The last one was of no value when you're talking about these major changes. As, as some of our uh, citizens have pointed out, there are big changes like the idea that it's no longer just these private sewer lines, but it's actually all homeowners. Just to remind you, a few years ago, there was massive changes in parking regulations. It passed unanimously. And then look what happened a few months later when public found out what was involved. There was a real uproar. I think that's what would happen if people found out about the implications of this measure. That's why it needs more thoughtful consideration and why I'd respectfully ask you to continue it. Have another workshop where we can look at this in advance and not on three days notice and ask our questions in three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Hello, Council. My name is Zachary Craigle. I've been a Placerville resident for the past 10 years. Um, I submitted my letter online. Um, it's got some numbers in it with prices and that sort of thing. And um, as city residents, we pay more than what you would normally pay on EID. And EID covers your lateral from the main to your meter, where we are responsible for all of that up to the main. So we pay higher, um, a higher price, and we get less service. Um, but you can read that in my letter. Um, a couple of the things that I wanted to say, the revisions or alternatives to this, would be determine an appropriate fee that would make it feasible for the city to maintain the sewer lateral from the main to the meter. This would make the city sewer service comparable to that of EID. Um, when I attended the workshop on this on May 24th, um, it was brought up, but I didn't see it um, posted as a suggestion um, as an alternative on the city staff report. Um, another thing um, that I would suggest would be to remove the requirement of obtaining the certification of lateral compliance um, upon title transfer of the property. Not all homeowners are in this to make a profit. Some have to sell to pay medical bills or because of their death in the family or a primary breadwinner. Um, we should think of the most vulnerable in a community and not just make a policy decision and burden people struggling. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. How can we find out who's on the same line that I'm on? We asked this last uh, May. It was mentioned that the staff would get that information to us. It never happened. My name is French, by the way. I'm sorry. Lorne French. So how can we find out who's on the, on the lateral? <coughs> Okay, well, we can answer some of these afterwards, but you can go ahead and keep giving your comments. I know, that's, that's all I want to know is that how do okay. we find out? Well, how can I find out? We'll work with you after, after public comments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm going to have to wear my glasses and it throws me way off. <laughs> Um, I agree with Mr. Copeland, Mr. Craigle, Mr. Smith. Um, 
amen to Ryan Carter, a whole bunch of the other commenters, and, and Council Member Yarbrough, especially on the problem with the city getting into blocking real estate transactions. Um, this is a much worse version than the previous one. I was at that workshop. We gave, there was, the whole room was like this size, gave a lot of input, and most of it seems to be ignored except for doubling the 10-year to 20-year, and ABS pipe can last forever. Um, this does af appear to affect every property with a sewer line, residential, commercial, everybody. And I think it's a very draconian sewer ordinance and it is an attack upon the property owners and voters of this city, the same voters that passed measures H and L to pay for ro um, roads and pipes. And now you turn around and you do this to the voters and the property owners. Um, measure H and L should pay for all the work in city right away. The property line should be the dividing line, just like the water line is. That's where the meter is. To put the cost of digging into the street on the private property owner is ridiculous. And you absolutely should just scrap the whole section that mentions you cannot sell your property until you bring your um, your line up to current code. Very expensive. It will destroy many escrows and decimate some property values, if not citywide values. And just take the example of a military property owner gets orders to transfer, has to do a quick sale. He's probably already gone, and then he puts his listing up. You are going to screw over that military guy if a problem comes up with his line, and he can't sell his house, and he's maybe on the other side of the world. Nice job. Um, you definitely should send this back with all the new language that's in there and shifting all the authority from the director to the building official. So many changes, this definitely has to go back to a public workshop and maybe staff can listen this time. Um, a camera inspection is about 400 bucks and I have a problem with, seems like a Fifth Amendment violation because you are forcing somebody to turn over evidence of their property to the city, to the government, for an analysis of violation. Let that sink in, that is just wrong. The multiple property sharing of a private sewer network, network is a civil action between those property owners, do not drag the rest of the city into it. I have more, but please send this back to a workshop. Thank you, Mike. Any more comments on this item? I want to make sure we get everybody's in. All right, seeing no more, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, your comments this evening. Uh, there's obviously a lot of things um, before we um, have further uh, discussions here at the dais. I, I know, Cleve, you were going to, um, I think, make a comment at least on one item, but I didn't know if staff wanted to make any other clarify clarifying comments before we get into further discussion. Yeah, let's have our city engineer first talk about additional, a little bit about uh, where we're at and why we're doing this. So, yep. Thank you. So in, um, you know, uh, I heard one public comment regarding the INI smoke test that was completed in 1998-1999 era. Uh, that study concluded it had 207 total collection and observation points. And out of those 207 locations where there was an observed failure, 144 of them were from private laterals, which represents 69.6% of the smoke areas were identified as private laterals for that study. Um, I just want to kind of uh, kind of go through why we're um, at where we are in terms of history on this too. Um, you know, we've mentioned that this was brought forward in 2018. Why then, right? The reason why we brought it forward in 2018 was because we had a notice of violation at our wastewater treatment plant, which resulted in a spill of 9 million gallons, 
we received a notice of violation and firm direction from the State that we are to engage in a private sewer lateral ordinance. Fast forward, New Year's Eve of 2022, we had a spill. From, we went from 9 million gallons to 1.5 million gallons. And the reason why that number went down so dramatically with a more than double storm, the 2017 storm was a 129-year storm, the New Year's Eve storm was, it was a 350-year storm, so a much more intense storm. The reason why we went down in that spill volume was because we have been attempting to address our INI in the city system. We deliver INI projects often. We have actually completed three in the last six months, and we have done about 25 of them in the last six years. And that includes improvements at the wastewater treatment plant that allows us to process the materials faster and more efficiently. If we couldn't fix how fast the ball was being pitched at us, we had to fix the catcher's mitt. So with regards to that, that is part of the reason why we are here. Um, the City has tried to do its part as far as delivering projects, and we do it well with Measure h &L. The other part to this is on a recent, and I, th I think I can daylight this just because it is you know, already publicly available, is there is a recent PRA request into the City regarding a private sewer lateral requesting information on how it came to be. And this information came from a private property owner who moved here from out of state, East Coast, where inspections of private sewer lateral ordinances or private sewer laterals is required. He inquired this of his real estate agent. The real estate agent advised the property purchaser to not do that. It is not really needed and it is not required out here. That is not a requirement in this area. He is now submitting PRA requests because he is trying to find a solution as to why he purchased a home that has a failed sewer lateral and he has no way of fixing it. This happens to us and what we see all the time. So as much as this is, you know, something to consider in terms of residents that are negatively affected when those lines aren't inspected. Just a thought. Thank you, Rebecca. Pierre, did you have anything to further at this time? I don't have anything to add. Let me go through my notes and see if there's any any specific questions that were given that I could address or if the council recalls any question that may have been given that you would like staff to uh, to address. I think the question on how do you find out who else is on your private sewer lateral line, that was a question asked. Yeah, that is very difficult uh, to answer. That is a very good question. So we do maintain a, uh, a booklet in, in, in inventory, if you will, of all the private sewer systems that we know of in the city. And I think the number is about, what, 80 some private systems now? more than that, maybe around 90 or 90 so. So we map them out. And so every time we get information, typically if we don't, if it's unknown, then there's no way for us to know. So we rely on that, on that inventory. So people do come in from time to time. We're able to show them the booklet. And then uh, they can see the properties that are tied into that uh, common uh, lateral. But I think his name was Mr. French. Um, I don't know where, where he resides, but I don't know if he's come to staff and we actually look to see if his uh, home is located within one of those areas served by a private sewer lateral, but we can certainly do that for him. But if he's not in there and he thinks he's served by a private lateral, we're not going to know where that line is. Okay. Do you want so how many sewer connections are there about? How many? Uh, Dave, you might know. You, 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 yeah. About? Approximately 3,400. There's about 3,400 hookups. Okay. I'm assuming that most of these hookups are like the one I have at my home, that it goes out of my house and into the city pipe. 
and there's nothing in between. So the vast majority of the hookups in this city are like that. Is that reasonable? Okay. And we have about 90 of these multiple hookup things where you've got more than one person on a pipe that goes into the sewer, correct? About. Correct, and I would just add, I just want to make sure you're aware, and um, Rebecca, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's about 30 or so of those 90 mm -hmm. have a sewer maintenance agreement in place. Okay, so they're like the folks on, on Bush. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're talking, I mean, I'm not minimizing this at all, but I'm, try, I'm just trying to get the framework and the foundation set up. We're talking about a fairly small subset of all the sewer hookups in the city. I will tell you a story. Uh, my mother, rest her soul, uh, died. She lived in a little town called Crockett in Contra Costa County. All of us inherited her home. Um, for the longest time, my mother had been having problems with her sewer system. And, and her lateral, I'm not, once again, I don't want to overblow this. Her lateral might have been 50 feet from where all the sewers collected, went under the driveway and out to the main line on Rolf Park Drive. Um, she passes away. We all inherit the house. Thanks, Mom. Um, and um, we decide to sell it. When we sold it, you know what we had to do? We had to fix the pipe. That was a rule in Contra Costa County. That's exactly what they have here. We fix the pipe. We had, you know, we used the uh, proceeds from the escrow and we fixed it before we could close. That's how you whittle away at some of this trouble. Now, this is a thorny issue because this sewer, these laterals sound like private roads. And the person at the front of the private road never wants to spend the same amount of per money or, you know, as the person at the end of the road because, well, they only use the first hundred feet of it. Why do they have to do all their buddies and their neighbors? Um, um, I, have seen, I mean, I've read through, I'm assuming that the striked out version we received tonight in the agenda, the, the, the parts that are there that are struck out are, were in the original text that, that the folks saw at the workshop. Yeah, the underlying strikeout version you have, that would have been the, the last version, uh, ver version that was sent to the city council, and that was the version that was uh, presented to the public at the workshop. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to send this thing back and have it chewed on again and have another meeting with the public and say, you know, let's really sit down and say, I read through it, and I don't, it doesn't seem like the corrections are that significant, but I wasn't there at the meeting, so I don't want to say. Um, this is a problem when we talked to God, I'm so this is so weird. When we talked about this the first time we talked about this back in 2018, one of the big questions always is, you have these problems on these private laterals. They, and this was for all the private laterals. We were talking about single ones, multiple ones, every one of them. There's a, there's a, there's a problem on private property. How much of the public do you want to pay for that problem? How much of it? Because that's what you're starting to talk about here. If you don't ask the people that have these multiple sewer lines, these collective sewer lines, to somehow figure out a way to fix them, then the only other place there's money is the public. And so how much of the rest of us, the 3,000 or so sewer hookups in town, um, want to pay for that? And that's a question. That's a question that is a public policy question, something we have to wrestle with all the time. Um, measures H and L pay for a lot of things. It's one of the reasons why we fix some of our problems with this. Um, it's a thorny issue. Nobody wakes up in the morning deciding how to, you know, PO people in town here. I know I don't. But this is not going away. We have to figure out a way to fix it. And I think if you wait for the collective, like, oh, we'll send them some information, and maybe they'll all just decide they want to do this, that's wishful thinking. The reason why there's these issues at close of an escrow is because that's when you got everybody's attention. That's when you can do the measuring. That's when you can go in and do the scoping. And that's when you can kind of make a solution happen. They did it with my mom. And they do this in a lot of other places. I, I, don't, I can't speak for the entire area. I'm sure our staff did some digging on who has these kinds of, of uh, 
ordinances. Um, you know, we had to do this when we, when we had to deal with the sewer rates, and that was painful. But for decades or years, I guess not decades, but for well, a long time, city councils had just kind of kicked the can down the road because nobody wants to, I don't want to make any of you people unhappy. I like all of you. I don't even know some of you, but I like y'all. But we weren't collecting enough money to pay our bills. And then we had to fix it. Sometimes you got to rip the Band-Aid off. Now, if this needs to go back for more review and maybe some fine-tuning and maybe we come up with some hardship cases, the reality is most people that sell their homes aren't going off to war and they're not, you know, they're, they're just selling a house. They probably have a little equity. There's probably a little bit of money there. I'm not wanting to take any of it, but, you know, let's not, let's not focus in on the exceptions when the rule is going to be most people. In fact, most people in this town, if they have to comply with this, are going to be scoping their sewer that goes out to the street. And that's it. They're not going to be involved with anybody else. And if it's no good, we need to fix it. If mine's no good, well, I already replaced it at my rental. I replaced all the pipes. So anyway, this is a tough call, but, you know, um, I had some other stuff I wrote down. Um, Uh, how many, oh, so you already answered the question that there are some of these, there was like 20 of the 90 or 30 of the 90 have the, the really cool agreements. That thumbs up. Great. Maybe there's a way to deal. Maybe there's a way to deal with that. Um, oh, and then you already mentioned the thing about the failed tests. You don't, you don't meter sewer lines. You don't meter them. There's no meter on a sewer line. You meter the water. And we have the same rule about that. This is just, this is totally off topic, but we are, we are responsible, the city's responsible for everything up to the water meter, then you're responsible for everything on the other side of that. Just like EID, just like everybody else. If you think we're treating you differently, we're not. It's all the same. Now this issue of the sidewalk, I'd be willing to kind of think about that because you start digging up sidewalks and streets and that could get to be a real big price. But at some point, the, 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 the you know, Private property is private property. Public property is public property. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Clarici. Um, you know, I, I, I go back to what I, I mean, what I originally said about putting a thumb on transactions. I mean, a lot of this, I mean, and just like our folks up here in the front on Bush Court, you know, it's remarkable what the uh, private uh, market will do, and that is the private market took care of the problem itself. Um, I understand we have issues and we may have ways to compel people with these private sewer lines that are on multiples to figure out a way, uh, but ultimately this is still a private transaction. These are private transactions between two private individuals or entities. Um, I would prefer not to have the city in the middle of that, uh, if all possible. I understand some cities have done this. Bay Area, there's certainly more that have done this. And they've also, you know, I did do quite a bit of research. A lot of them have provided financial assistance uh, with this. Uh, they've done low term, uh, long term loans at low interest rates for people to be able to actually effectuate those changes. Uh, we don't have those resources to do that. I mean, we could have that conversation, but, uh, you know, what would we be taking away from in order to do that? Um, I, you know, it's, I think David said it, when you buy a house, it's buyer's beware. You should do all of your due diligence when you buy something. And if that's an issue with the escrow transaction, then, you know, you should be able to take care of it in that manner. Or you can roll the dice and figure it out later if you think that's, you know, something you want to live with. That's what people do. They do trade-offs when they're buying real estate. Um, and in this market, with 8% interest rates, when no other city, no other area in El Dorado County or even in this area has this, why add one more thing to our uh, residents so that it can make it that much harder to move inventory in our area? I do understand the need to, to make these fixes, and when there's a spill, we should take the appropriate action as a city to hold that private person responsible and you know, if we had to do the cleanup ourselves, I don't know if we had to do those, but then we should lean the property or do what we have to in order to recoup those costs. But I do have a serious issue with the way this is currently written. And I'm not even sure that another uh, workshop is a solution if this is going to be even within the realm of what's going to come back. Because I just don't see myself, at least for myself, supporting anything like this. Thank you. 
M Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I would like to add a couple things. Sorry, I should have added it sooner. Um, just because there are 90 known systems, I think part of this ordinance is um, due to the fact that we don't know where all the uh, private sewer systems are. Public works staff get called out all the time and we discover new ones on a regular basis. And then the other thing is that we regularly um, clean those up as a health and safety issue and then it takes us away from other duties. So just want to add that. Thank you. Well, I think home maintenance, property maintenance is part of home ownership. And um, a lot of what I'm hearing is, you know, well, we don't want to worry about it. We'll let the next guy worry about it. And I hear what you're saying about buyers beware, but you have a young family who's buying their first home and they don't have the money to do all those studies. So they're thrown into the Russian roulette game. Are we part of this percentage that we know is a problem in the city? Um, I'm not in favor of letting it sewer spill and then fixing it later and worrying about it later and leaning properties. I think we need to be proactive about it. And if we need to change some of the language, I, I, but I think we need to move forward with this. And I think we need to think about the public safety of the city. And, and we know that all these problems exist and not turn our head and go, oh, well, it'll be someone else's problem down the road. And I would just say, I mean, in terms of the flooding, I mean, that's an anomalous event. That is a 350 year flood. We're not getting that every year. You know, if we start having these every year, maybe I'd have a different opinion on it. But I mean, I'm not going to use the anomalous example also as a reason why we would be doing this as well. We've had at least five or six of these events in the last five years, at least, because it happened three times when I was the mayor, <laughs> or at least twice, and I think three times, where we were pushing sewer water in the, in the Hangtown Creek. And it's happened since then. This is not an anomaly. And this ain't getting any better. And the other thing, too, and I think it was mentioned by staff, if you've got the state of California hanging on your rear end, there's no getting out from underneath this. So I think we try to come They're up. not asking us to pass one, though. I mean, we, they have not been mandated to do it. They haven't been mandated to do it. But you know what? You do enough of these spills, and they'll be Mayor, here. I mean, Mayor, if I may, yeah. they actually are. It was part of our. Do we have a letter mandating that? Yes, sir. Yes. We do have it. Yes, we do. Why didn't we have that as part of the package? I don't that, know. I'd like to see clarification on that if that's the case. Well, uh, we, we do have to do an ordinance. Yes. It doesn't have to be this ordinance. That's okay. what I want to emphasize, okay? Um, the, the main thing that I'm hearing, the main problem is that, that trigger of when a home yeah. sells. We can take that out. It doesn't provide the proactive I'd like to see if there's something else we could find to be more proactive in how we do this and and maybe we do send it back and say okay what other ideas do we have how can we be more proactive to capture these that mm -hmm. before and an before something happens but <coughs> but I, yeah just to emphasize we, we do have that from the state and we mentioned it previously but I want to emphasize that it doesn't they don't tell us what the ordinance has to be understand they, they just say we want you to clean it up I'm just saying if you want I mean so yeah all right, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can I can add a few things in here. So I, I've got a couple of questions too for staff. So um, how far back do our maps go of our sewer system? <laughs> I know that's a really crazy question and I've been doing construction in this county for many, many years and I know a lot of stuff didn't even get caught up until like the 80s. So <laughs> just out of curiosity with, with the known people that we have on the laterals, do we have actual maps of where their lines are running? The ones we do know, yes. Okay. So, but ahead, Nick, Nick there, as you... There, there are several out there that we have no idea about. Right. So as... Of, we, we know where the city sewer mains are at. It's the private ones that are from your house, your toilet, to where it connects to the city main that we have absolutely no idea. And that's what I was talking about. That uh, An example is that, say... 100 years ago, somebody had a 10 acre parcel. They split it off into an acre here, an acre there, whatever. Instead of each one of those uh, property owners connecting a new service that went to the street, they've all said, hey, it's a little bit cheaper if we go on and tie on here. That's how uh, the basis for a lot of these systems has originated. We don't have maps for any of those. There's no, for several of them, we don't have maps. And okay, so I might- We get a call that there's a spill out there. And even in those private sewer system um, binders that we have, it's it's a lot of rough estimation because guys have just gone out there under the gun when there's sewage it's an emergency situation and so it's expedited and we're just trying to do everything that we can so they dig patch it and cover it up yeah 
Right. No, that, that I understand, and, and I know that happens. Okay, so basically at this point, when that happens, we're just, we're, we have to be reactive. There is no proactive part that we have, because I know there's ways of tracing pipelines, but sometimes being able to do that if it's too deep and losing signals and stuff just gets absolutely difficult. All right, so that answers one of the questions. Um, I mean, we currently have an ordinance that says you're responsible for your sewer line from your house to where it connects with the city, correct? Okay, so in this, I mean, one of the things that I would I would like to see change is where that stops. So if you've got somebody three houses down, obviously it's on their property, it's gonna have to be their responsibility. I think if we're gonna do something like this, part of what I would like to see change is that your responsibility stops at your property line. Okay, so I mean, are, are we going to force homeowners to dig up a street to the middle of the street where we connect with the city. You know, I mean, are, are we trying to contract with the city to get that kind of stuff done? Can we even do that? Um, also with this, if we're gonna try and hash this out and get it together, are we working with the local real estate um, associations in putting in documentation required by the city during a transaction to sell a piece of property that discloses this kind of information? Um, the, the seller would basically have to give to the buyer. Okay, that, that kind of takes the, a little bit of the buyer beware part out. Now, yes, it is still the buyer's responsibility to do these inspections. I mean, I know I did a roof inspection, I did a sewer inspection, you know, HVAC, all that kind of stuff. Most of those inspections add up to about 1500 bucks, including scoping a sewer line. So, I mean, it, it, yes, some people waive those contingencies to get the deal, that is something that they're going to have to live with, but there are ways and it's, it's, is it costly? 1500 bucks to some people is a lot of money, but if you're buying a $500,000 home, I would definitely spend $1,500 to figure out what might be wrong. Okay. Um, us holding up the transaction because of an issue like this, that's where I start having a little bit of an issue. Um, just because I think that's just going to open up a can of worms for, possibly legal action that, you know, we may not want to deal with. Uh, let's see, what else did I have on here? Do, 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 do. And then obviously, um, once a sale is made, we get notified from what, the title association or the county? When a sale of a home is made, who notifies us? Is it the title company that sends out information or is it the county uh, recorder's office that sends us, says, hey, you just had a house sell? The house sells, that's from the title company. Okay, so you get notification from the title company? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I do agree with uh, options other than full replacement with, uh, you know, possibly modern techniques. So, you know, I, I, I don't think we're doing a bad thing here. Um, I just think that there's a few things that we're definitely going to have to hash out a little bit more to get straightened out. Like one of the things I would actually like to see in here also is like the people at Bush Court, if we have those residences or those communities that are already set up, then we need some sort of language in here that says, hey, if these communities already have it, they're not required for this. Okay, you know, some sort of an exclusion or some sort of, hey, you know what, it, it's good for X amount of years, like, you know, 40 years, however, I mean, it's all PVC and we know for a fact it's gonna last 50 years, then, you know, we should give them that 50 years. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not against any of this because it, you know, we, we definitely need to fix this problem. I mean, we don't want sewage spilling. Unfortunately, we live in an old town and an old city and things are going to happen, but it's going to be a case by case basis, obviously. But, uh, yeah, getting into this, I think we definitely need to, uh, hash out a little bit more of the language. Uh, and as a historical note, we we actually did like a pipe burst on my mom's lateral. So we were able to do that. Um, do we, uh, Nick, or anybody, anybody, um, when they have these sewage spills on people's private property, do we ever recoup the cost? Almost, ne almost never. It depends on the severity of the spill, but right. usually... Um, it's a lot more labor intensive to, to go after that than it is to actually just go up there and clean it up and be done with it and then uh, put them on notice that they need to make those corrections or repairs. Thank you. All right. Um, 
So, I mean, I certainly like want to do something that's proactive towards preventing, you know, releases before they happen than just waiting until they happen. Um, I think that's a good environmental policy and something that we would all want. I do have concerns with it being tied to property transactions, particularly for the folks on uh, common or shared lines where one person wants to sell their home and one of their neighbors is uncooperative, whether that's a you know absentee owner or et cetera. If they're saying, you can't come on my property to repair it, I'm not going to help with the costs um, or my share of the costs. Uh, I mean, you certainly can't have a property owner. It sort of holds up their sale or their ability to move forward with what they want to do with their own property or getting rid of their own property because someone else says, you can't come on my property or I'm not going to do my fair share of this work. And then you're in civil litigation with them that takes years and you're stuck with an inability to sell your property and move forward. So I don't want to put anyone in our city in that situation. And I think we will put some people in that situation with this as written. Um, there's essentially two, we're allowed to set uh, what triggers we want is my understanding. We currently have eight triggers listed in our ordinance. Um, I'm essentially okay with all of them except for number one, which is the property transfer trigger. And then I think trigger seven needs more clarification on it where it says 20 years and when that goes into effect, if that's just any sewer line out there more than 20 years old or there's some other trigger on that. So seven and one are the two triggers that are concerning to me. And I guess if those were removed and some other changes were made on things like we were talking about repairs being allowed if they're using modern techniques and that's a viable option, similar to what we're doing for the commercial properties um, and clarification on the additional, um, the additional um, plumbing being new plumbing uh, I guess additional new plumbing or how we want to frame that. I think that was Mr. Carter's comment. I think some language there to make it explicit that you're talking about new fixtures, not replacement or renovation of existing ones. So that's sort of my comments and thoughts of a way to move forward with this. I think we need to move forward with something um, and working with what we have, but kind of getting rid of a couple of the triggers that I think are the most um, potentially problematic. Thank you, council member. Other comments? So, okay. So the, 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 the common, the, the, group, the group sewer lateral thing, I'm, I, don't, I can't even think of it right now, but there needs to be some way to capture these people and then have it be a thing where the city, uh, like, um, you don't stop a transaction. Because essentially then what you're saying is, well, if you have a bunch of in, uh, sort of recalcitrant sort of uh, people on this one sewer line and they don't want to do anything, they're basically getting out of jail free. Because someone else if you're not going to, you're going to, you're basically going to kick the can down the road until they call Nick to come and fix the problem. And that's not what we're trying to do here. So maybe we can get some language together to start a process where we do a little bit more digging on these things, find out who these property owners are. And then I don't know what you do, though. You, you know, once again, we don't want to get into the I don't want to compel people to do something because that seems like it's not the right thing. Um, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to warn folks of this thing. So yeah, I, I understand the part where you know the lines that we don't know about. Well, yeah, we're not going to find them until something. Happens. <laughs> well, that yes, yes, yes. The lines that we do know about. I mean, yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't it work the same way as like um, you know the sidewalk in front of your house? If you're responsible for the sidewalk in front of your house, you're responsible for fixing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about when it comes to the property lines with the sewer systems. Also, I know if I scope sewer and it gets to my property line and there's a hole in there, then obviously I'm going to repair right. it up to my property line because I don't have the right to cross into somebody else's property without their permission to fix anything. Nor am I probably going to scope their property to find out if they have a problem. Okay. No, 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 not necessarily. Right. No. So at that point, you know. So you just fix what's on your property. You're fixing what's on your property now. Obviously, if something happens on another property and the city has to go in and do something about it, then 
obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're already stuck with that issue but to begin with. people upstream have really nice pipes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's where it comes. Yeah. Like if that's you're at the, the end of the line and you fix it to your property line, you're not doing anything to fix the problem because. Well, no. You know. Because. Yeah. It's, Yeah. But I, I, I mean, well, maybe that's so. What I'm saying, yes. so what I'm saying is, I mean, if 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 you're only, sc I mean, so are we going are we going to require people to <sighs> scope a sewer line if they're at the top of the hill, all, all the way, way to down the to the bottom of the hill, and if no. they find problems with everybody else's, they're going to report that to everybody. See, yeah, this is we're going to get into a can of worms there that you don't even want to yeah. get into. Well, that was now the first question. Of privacy, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, so, I, 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 yeah, and that's the concern because the way this is written right now, that's what it. Right. That's what you, As have, you to have to do. And maybe and maybe the idea is that eventually all the properties will eventually change hands. True. And then if you do have a then there has to be maybe a bit oh boy, I'm gonna get in trouble. There has to be maybe a bigger hammer on when you have these spills. We don't just go, yeah. well, you know, if it's a small spill, we just kinda go out and do it, blah, 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 you know, leave it up to the good and he's a wonderful person. I mean, he's a charitable man. But um, well, it would be one way to. It's the one way you solve that problem. For bad is, actors. Yeah, for bad actors. You yeah. go, okay, the minute we come onto your property to have to fix this, that's the day you're fixing it. Right. And there's no yamini, yamini, yam, and I'm. I'm yeah. I think we might have to work out some way, like you know, yeah. the mayor was saying, you know, some other communities have, like, okay, look, we know you probably don't have. $42,000 or $15,000 to fix this right away, but as a city, maybe there's something that we can. Right you know, some, something that we can do to help or set up a payment plan or set up, you know, something, you know, along the lines. I mean, I don't know what the exact answer is, but yeah, I mean, I'm, like I said, the way the language is written, we've got a, a start. Yeah, yeah. I don't I mean, say it's a great that's start, fine. but we've got a start. I look, yeah, we're, there's going to be some other things that we're definitely going to have to get over the hump of to get this completely dialed sure. in. So, but definitely I agree with uh, Council Member Gottberg on the, you know, eliminating the stop of a sale of a transaction, and you know, we don't want to get in into any of that. Um, I would say there was probably out of, out of the Bay Area cities and municipalities that require the sewer lateral, um, at least three of them had some kind of um, public right. financial assistance attached to to it, and I think partly because I mean, and for, especially for those that had the actual real estate requirement in their language, oh, yeah, yeah. that was really the only way probably for them to not become like the ones that stop transactions from happening, yeah. uh, that the city essentially then does the repairs and then I guess they they end up billing somebody for for all of it. So. Yeah, we, we just had a private contractor came out. They just, they plowed a new line through there and it was all good and yeah, so yeah. But I think that's how you do it. You get, you know, fix, fix it, fix it on your property. I like that. Yeah, but I, and I do like the idea of of you know we're probably going to have to go after the bad actors. I mean, it shouldn't be on the city's responsibility either to have to continue like to have Nick no. come out and clean up because it's too expensive or because they just don't want to do it. I mean, it's also a a choice, right? Sometimes you know, do I want to go on a trip or do I want to fix a sewer line? I mean, I I, I can tell you what <laughs> I probably would want to do uh, versus what I I have to do, and sometimes people pick what they want to do. Uh, and so th there should be uh, repercussions for that. But I'm also, I mean, just as a global policy issue, you know, because this does affect every single property. This isn't just about those that have those private sewer laterals. This is every single property in the city of, of Placerville that, you know, has 20, in that 20 year uh, window frame. So this is a big issue. This isn't just 90, you know, properties or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, you add $15,000 onto a, a real estate transaction, you know, that means something, especially when you can go next door and you don't have to deal with that. If you want to live in this area, then maybe you're like, oh, well, I'll just live right outside the city lines. So I, I really don't want to affect real estate transactions. So, and yeah, I mean, we can just, uh, we actually don't have to, I mean, we can just agree to send it back if we, if. We, we could send a subcommittee of two council members to help with all, all that, too. We have, yeah, it's we have true. a it's lot not of a opinions up here. It might help staff better to, to be working with us. Yeah. I like that idea. Have a little subcommittee working group. I'm open to that as well, of having two people work with staff on, you know, 
some ways per our discussion tonight. I mean, it seems like there's at least three of us who have pretty big concerns about the property transaction component of this. So probably one of the three of us and then maybe one of the other two that would make sense. That don't care. <laughs> no. I'm just saying, I mean, that's one of the big issues in here that we've right. brought up, so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, so why do I do this? Let me try this. Um, I will, uh, I'll make a motion um, that we uh, table this item, 10.1, and establish a ad hoc committee of two members. Uh, and um, we can uh, pick which those two members are to work with staff to come back with another uh, another shot at this, another ordinance, another 10.1. Mayor Saragossa, um, in order for the two member subcommittee not to be subject to the Brown Act and have to you know, notice and all of that, um, the council should not be doing the appointment. You should be doing the appointment ah. without formal approval. Point people. All right, I can do that. So then if that's the case, I would appoint uh, council member Yarborough and council member No uh, to that uh, subcommittee. So if anyone has a, a problem or issue with that. No, 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 no. I'm just, <laughs> actually, I'm good with that. I shall um, appoint you. <laughs> so quick question, Mona. Um, so as an ad hoc, it's okay just to have the council and staff? Are we good with that? Yes, okay. as an ad hoc, okay. correct. Just, checking. just for my knowledge and being new. I'm going to second the motion. All right, we have a first and a second. Any further thoughts or clarifications or comments? All right, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. All right. Um, Third time's a charm, maybe? Yeah. Fourth time? We'll see. Since 2018. Yeah. A couple more sometime. Yeah, we didn't put a, a time date, so you know we'll work work this through. So thank you both for being voluntold. <laughs> yeah. I like that term. <laughs> and uh, for everyone that came out this evening, thank you for coming out. We really appreciate your comments. Uh, it's very helpful for us. I mean, it's, I was, you could tell a lot of discussion. Uh, about this item and you know what we bring back hopefully will be a, a better item so appreciate all that thank you I want to break I will we'll take a quick uh, five minute break thank you everyone <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. I, I should just say 10 minutes, because five minutes is never enough. So but thank you for bearing with us, everybody. All right, now let me get myself situated here. OK, what did I do with my? Yes. <laughs> I'm looking for my agenda, though, so I can actually read it. So we are moving to item 12.1. No public discussions this evening, item 11. So we're moving to item 12 in 12.1, uh, which is to receive a presentation on hometown holiday events, formerly the Festival of Lights, scheduled for Friday, November 24, 2023, and approve uh, an approval of alternative to historic tree lighting. And Mr. Morris is kicking this off for us. Actually, Mr. Zeller will take All right, this. Terry. Leave, Terry. Okay, yeah. Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, two things tonight, uh, as you'd mentioned, uh, we have a uh, representative of the El Dorado Community Foundation, uh, Paul Zapatini, is here tonight to um, discuss uh, what the community can expect for this November 24th. And also, um, once uh, we go through that, there is some discussion about um, what we do for our Christmas tree. Um, for this year, and I wanted to mention also that the um, uh, the new title of this event is Hometown Holidays, and it is still on the last on uh, on Black Friday after Thanksgiving. And um, if Mr. Sapatini is ready, I'll call him up to give his uh, presentation. Welcome. And thank you for hanging in there on the time. So appreciate it. Uh, good evening to 
Mr. Mayor and the Council. So do we have, Mr. Zeller, do we have something to put up on a screen right now by any chance? And who is going to do that? Because I'm not. Dave? Okay, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Warren. Yeah, we'll pull that up from the laptop. So, who's ready for a hometown holiday is the question. Um, so, I'm here. I'm not Bill Roby. I don't pretend to be Bill Roby. I am his uh, stand-in because um, his partner had neck surgery yesterday and doing well. Um, so, um, <clears throat> we're here to talk about hometown holidays, and I'm going to give a brief presentation, answer any questions that the council may have or that the audience who just left may have. Uh, up on the board, hometown holidays, November 24th, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. in downtown Placerville. Uh, this is going to be a traditional holiday celebration featuring local school choirs, bands, theater groups, including El Dorado High School, Ponderosa High School, uh, the Cantori Corral, Folsom Lake College Choir, and Imagination Theater as your presenters during the evening. Uh, we have worked closely with the city, and I want to thank Cleve and uh, Terry. Uh, we've had multiple meetings about this. We have more coming. Uh, we've buttoned down most of the details about this. I'm going to talk about a few of them and answer any questions you might have. So <clears throat> it is a collaboration with the city and the El Dorado uh, Community Foundation. Merchants with downtown have been contacted, although I just heard from one that we haven't been talking enough with them about this, but we will. Um, the great news to share with you is that we will have a tree lighting. It will be different from previous years because our tree is not worthy anymore. Um, but Sierra Pacific Industries has stepped up and is providing us with a 20 to 25 foot tree that will be installed next to the courthouse by Doug Veerkamp Engineering and taken down by Doug Veerkamp Engineering. Uh, the approximate installation and removal dates are about November 17 to December 13 or thereabout. So the tree will be there during the um, Christmas parade and most of the holidays. The reason it won't be up during Christmas and thereafter is because a tree that is cut from the forest and not in water doesn't last more than about three weeks. So that's the reason why it comes down prior to the actual holiday. Um, <coughs> there, is, there are other aspects to this. Uh, by November 1, we will actually have an entertainment calendar of the events that will occur the day of the November 24th event. Um, and that will be shared with uh, the city and with council. Uh, but we're very excited that there will be multiple locations from the courthouse uh, all the way down to the green room where there will be presentations of theatrical, choral, and band uh, with our local schools being the featured folks. Um, lighting has been a question. Uh, one of the suggestions was that we do what has been referred to both as facade lighting or roof line lighting that would be permanent. We have funding for that, but we don't have yet the concurrence of our merchants. Um, the Planning Commission set a requirement that we have 95% of merchants agreeing to long-term facade or um, roof line type lighting. We have, as of today, 57% of the merchants have signed MOUs with the city, but we're not at the 90, anywhere near the 95%. Um, when I say we have funding for that, it's not 
it's at no cost to the city and it would have lighting overhead uh, throughout the year for our downtown area. So the question for the council ultimately, but we're not gonna answer that right now, Mr. Clarici, is um, whether uh, we uh, lower the 95% to some other percentage so that we can actually move forward with installing the facade or overhead lighting. In addition to that lighting, and regardless of whether that lighting is approved by the council, uh, we will have what's called up lighting at five to eight places between the courthouse and Sacramento Street. Uh, they will be above awning level, so there won't be any ability for people to screw with the lighting, so to speak. Uh, and the, that, but that lighting would only be around during the course of the season, whatever that ends up being. Um, there's a company in Sacramento that will be doing this up lighting. It's called Light It Up. Uh, they will also be, as I understand it, lighting the Christmas tree that will be planted near the courthouse uh, in the middle of November. Um, <clears throat> the activities will be situated throughout downtown from the bell tower and even below the bell tower all the way up to the courthouse. So we'll be blocking off Sacramento Street up to Bedford, but we're not gonna block it off for the entire Black Friday. Uh, the merchants have been uh, spoken with and they've agreed, at least conceptually, that we will block off from three until seven with activities being from four until seven. So uh, it will not impact their um, season um, and, and their ability to sell things. The local uh, downtown eateries are very much involved with this in the sense that they think they're gonna be packed anyhow. So um, they're happy with the uh, current arrangement. Um, <clears throat> we will have a DJ at the bell tower. We will have the corrals up near the courthouse. The lighting will happen up at the courthouse area at the same time as we will light all the trees on uh, Highway 50. So there will be a simultaneous lighting at approximately six o'clock that evening. Um, Gordon Vicini will bring his fire truck into town with Santa and Maureen Carter will be playing on the kaleidoscope or whatever that's called, calliope, thank you. And there will be uh, some festive music. The music is going to be situated sort of between the, this is my era, the 60s through the 80s type music will be with the DJ at the bell tower. Uh, Mayor Saragossa, have you been already asked to uh, introduce at the bell tower? We have, and I'm actually gonna tag team with the vice mayor, so yes. So there will be announcements down there and then we'll, at six o'clock, encourage the crowd to maybe move up the street for a moment at least for the lighting. But Santa Claus will be coming through town and um, we'll be exiting at Sacramento Street at the appropriate time. Um, I don't really have much more <clears throat> other than to answer questions, but we, like I said, we've been collaborating closely with uh, Cleve and with Terry, and I think we have most of the items in place and we're getting close to finalizing those. Questions? Thank you. Thank you for the update and presentation. Questions? I had, uh, I guess, one on the on the lights. So on the, just to get clarification, is it because it's just hard to get hold of the owners? The pro and I guess is it property owners or business owners that we're asking permission from, or both? It's my understanding it's property owners who have been contacted to get approval because they are the ones that would sign the MOUs. It's it's going to be a. Is that correct, Terry? I believe so. In other words, somebody who leases a space on Main Street is not going to be able to say, yes, you can put this up on my building. Understood. Uh, and then on the, the tree being, there's no like 
I think I, I heard David say, like, we can't do like just like a big bucket of water to keep that, so we don't have to we don't have to tear it down before. Only because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we we would put the Christmas tree up at the Capitol every year, which was a fresh cut tree that you know we would come from some part of California every year uh, when I was in the governor's office, and we kept it up I think until New a, after New Year's. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, if there's a, I mean, I certainly don't want to make it more uh, costly or 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 cost prohibitive, but. Um, but it would be nice to keep it till at least Christmas. Well, it's a great question. Uh, we have a meeting on Monday at 3 o'clock with Doug Veerkamp and with Sierra Pacific Industries, and we can ask them that. My understanding was that that's not necessarily realistic, and we have to deal with the state of California, who owns the courthouse and the court administrator, and we're working through those uh, details at this point in time. In other words, we, we're going to probably dig a hole to put something in the hole, but I don't know if that's including water. And thank goodness we had some rain the other day, so we have a little excess water maybe to use <laughs> for that. Understood. Hopefully we'll get some natural um, rain on it too. <laughs> there you go. Any other questions from the council? I volunteer to water the tree help. <laughs> yeah, it'd be really sad if we're not going to have a tree through Christmas. <laughs> yeah, the, idea, the idea of watering a dead tree is, is an interesting concept. Um, I, 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 but, yes, that, well, no, that, well, they, yeah, 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 never mind. Um, okay. If, we, if this thing is going to come down before Christmas, we have got to do a real thorough community uh, message on that because... Yeah, it, uh, it's it's gonna be rough. You know, yeah. it's gonna. Maybe well, we swap them out. Get another tree. I mean, yeah, SPI can get any a tree any day they want. You know, I so have, they can just I like have a spare fake tree that we could substitute for the twenty to twenty five footer. You know, they make big. They make really tall fake trees. And uh, we also have some green there. spray paint. What's that? <laughs> Green spray paint. Yes. I like it. I, I think we should try to figure out a way to have a tree there on Christmas. We will do so, our best. Yes, I really think we should try to do that. Uh, all of the citizens of this fine <laughs> That is just not a and our conversation council. I want to have with anybody. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, yes. Any, any other um, comments from staff? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, as Mr. Zappatini has described, there's also in the staff report, um, there is a plan for the tree location as discussed, but it is dependent upon approval from the Judicial Council, and also we need to get a uh, Council decision through this staff report. So you, there are four options. It's uh, light and decorate the bell tower as this year's tree. And yeah, that was, I think that was vetoed at, at another level, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it to the council. Okay. Uh, place a cut tree in the front landscaped area of the courthouse on Main Street as described. Uh, this will be in close proximity to the previous tree. Um, placing a cut tree in the commercial parking space on the east side of the bell tower, uh, which is not that popular with, uh, with the merchants. And placing a cut tree in the street or parking area on the north side of the bell tower. Um, between the bell tower and the businesses, and it would have that would have an impact on parking and street closure also. So um, we are working with the courts to try to focus on our uh, number two uh, option, but um, are looking for council direction. Thank you, Terry. And I'll take questions. Any questions for Terry, council? Leave you, you want to make a yeah, I just wanted to add in there, if it happens that the courts say, no, you cannot put a tree in the front of the courthouse, I, I think I would appreciate any input or direction the council can give so that we can uh, shift if we need to. I, I don't have another location. That was my last one that I came up with. And um, there, well, I will say that there, there may be another one, but it would mean being on private property and whether or not we could get approval to do that. But one of the, that's not in here, one of the, and I believe it was actually my city engineer mentioned it, would it be possible to put it uh, in the round table parking lot behind the sign that's there, again, a cut tree. Uh, so right at the front of that, but it would take up some parking in their parking lot, and I don't know what, but that may be a, a, an optional location that we could consider, but um, 
we are pushing and trying to get that approval and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think that location works best if we can do it. But Understood. All right, so we may have to contemplate a, a backup plan as part Correct. of our... Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take the other. The other thing for council's consideration is whether you want to lower the percentage. Of yeah. Next, yeah. Item. Next, Next item. item. Next. I'm sorry. I apologize. No. No problem. I had asked a question, so I don't. No problem. My fault. Okay. All right. Thank you. We may call you back up, but for now. We're going to go ahead and, and do public comment on this. So we are going to have hometown holidays, everybody. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up this item for public comment. It's very tall. Good evening. Ryan Carter speaking as a private citizen once again. Um, Thank you, Jackie. I also want to volunteer my services on the Bucket Brigade to water the tree. I heard that from a few people back here, but we definitely need to keep that tree uh, past Christmas. I mean, that would, yeah. Take it down on the 17th, you're gonna get a lot of phone calls uh, from, from my neighbors. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and I'm glad you brought up that uh, the uh, percentage uh, item uh, is not part of this, um, and that percentage does not actually exist, but we'll deal with that um, in the next item. But uh, yeah, let's keep this thing past Christmas, and I will definitely volunteer my services to water the tree also. So thank you. Thank you. Ruth Carter, City of Placerville. Um, so yeah, we uh, volunteer for Bucket Brigade, whatever we need to do to make sure that it goes through Christmas, please, you know, figure something out, put your big brains together. I know we can do it. Um, also as a, Hopefully we don't have to go there, but an alternative spot, maybe that commercial spot right next to the bell tower would be a good spot. Um, obviously it would mean constructing something that would keep that tree alive as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would just be too, it, it would be weird to have it in the parking lot. I don't know how else to say it. I just, I just don't think it's a good idea, but thank you for your consideration and hope you can come up with a good solution. Thank you. Ruth Michelson. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Appreciate it. I want to say, first of all, uh, so glad we are calling it hometown holiday event. Yay. Not festival of lights. Yay. I've been asking for that for, gosh, 10 years and was always told, that's impossible. That's how we brand it. Well, wow, gee whiz, we're going to unbrand it. Um, and, you know, the reason I don't like it is because that's what ha Hanukkah is called and, you know, enough already. Um, so my questions are for the presenter, are we going to have any stage areas built? I'm assuming not if street closure is at three, that's just an hour, and that's fine. And I'm really glad we're not having a longer closure. It really puts a big damper on the merchant's day to close it any earlier than three, so that's much appreciated. Um, I'd really like more merchant involvement. We do have an official merchant organization called Placerville Merchants on Main. Um, we have monthly meetings. The meetings are well attended. Uh, we were to have a presentation at our last meeting and the presenter was a no-show. Um, if you want input from merchants, we have a very wide um, mailing list. And so, you know, you mentioned input from merchants. I don't know. I have no idea which, which merchants have given input. I certainly was never asked. Um, let's see how am I doing on time. Um, so glad that on November 1st, there's going to be a calendar. I hope that that's distributed widely to merchants so we know what's going on. Um, tree near the courthouse. Yeah, I'd like a little more description on that one. Um, and I understand why you can't put it down at the bell tower because that's where those uh, trucks come in, the spot that Ruth Carter was mentioning. Mm -hmm. I think that's because the 18-wheelers come in to unload. She, I think she's talking about that spot that the uh, police department parks at. That's really not a, a, a feasible spot. Um, 
I'm not understanding about the above awning, awning lighting. I don't know why we're giving money to a Sacramento company rather than a local company to do that work. I don't know if it was, if local companies were approached to do the lighting. And I guess that's about it. And thank you for taking this on. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Um, good evening, Council. Kathy Lichman, Placerville resident. I am so excited about this, and I'm excited about the name Hometown Holiday because it really fits old-fashioned Christmases and holidays, uh, really fit into downtown Placerville and into the community. And um, I do have some questions, and I would like to thank the foundation for the part that they are playing in this and everybody else that's playing a part in it also. But taking up the leadership for it was really an important thing. Um, I have some questions. It's kind of random. I, I, don't, I don't quite understand what the uplighting is, uh, what that is, and what, what that is for. Um, I know he said music from the, I don't know, 70s, 80s, but holiday music is perfect for down there too. I remember when Lisa Crummitz was in charge of the, of the downtown and she had different um, people playing music in different parts of the town. They signed up for a certain amount of time and it was a lot of schools and local groups and I'm so happy to see something like that coming back again. And um, the bell tower can always be decorated uh, with Christmas lights. Um, I wondered, um, I don't know if this is possible, if it's too much of a slope or what, if the tree can't be put at the courthouse, could be put across the street in the Monument Garden area that's um, pavers. Um, I don't know if it's leveled enough, but if, if it could be put in a parking lot in Round Table, it seems like it could be put there if that doesn't work out. Anyway, um, I do agree that if you can get a lower threshold on the, um, the owners that want to do the lights, that would be better. But I'm just thrilled. This is really a great step for the community, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I know there will be a lot of people coming from out of town that will probably be disappointed, but I really think that this is a great thing, and I thank the foundation very much. Thank you. Smith, just to echo what everybody else has said, it's a great idea. And I remember about 10 years ago, it was just wonderful. It was the pre-Las uh, Vegas revival hour business we had on Main Street. The old style that's described really was great. You could almost hear Bing Crosby as you walk down the street. So I like the idea. One suggestion, it's up to you whether you want to reduce the numbers. It seems like you want to have as many people have lights as possible on Main Street. Just to let you know, um, their flyer, their, their package came to me. I'm not the owner of four properties on Main Street. I signed over the deeds to other folks who are 2,000 miles away. So my suggestion is don't give up on the other people. Just get on the phone and start calling them. Uh, I, I've tried to clarify that with both sides, water bills, you name it. It takes a while for that kind of stuff to crop up. So I wouldn't give up on the other numbers. I'd get on the phone and call them. And I wouldn't stick to just lights on the top because the roof lines vary and you could have, have them lower if, if, if folks want. Because um, years ago when you had a workshop on changing Main Street, digging it up, uh, one of the questions asked was, should we have more lights on Main Street? And universally the strong answer was yes. And it went on for about four or five meetings before we finally found out that the reason was that the given was that the present street lights are paid for by PG&E, so we couldn't add more of them. If you, any way you can get more lights, the public, at least on Main Street, wants them. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Sue Rodman, Placerville resident. I hope this is going back to where we don't have these huge stage and these big jumbotron. Jumbotron, thanks. I hope those are out. Are they out? 
Oh, good. I can come to, I can come to hometown holiday then yeah. because I just could not stand those jumbotron things. That was a mess. So good. I'll look forward to this one then. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment, bring it back for further discussion with council. Should we let Paul answer some of those questions? Yeah, uh, Paul, if you want to, yeah, except, except the lights. Um, any, if you wanted to add any more context. Uplights. So just up, the uplighting, though, uplighting. maybe. What is uplighting? Uplighting, I don't have no idea what that is. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I can add it. I Basically, it's... I understand it starts at a certain level, which will not be on the street, right. and will shoot up to the top of the building. And it the projects, is it the projects? Ver projected? Various and colors. It will be yeah. Christmas-type color. Yes. Okay. Um, there will be other lighting on Main Street. There will be other trees besides the big tree in the cutouts. Uh, there will be lighting around all of the posts. Um, we will be encouraging the merchants, and when I meet with them on November 8th, to light up their own places. Um, there will be opportunities for the merchants to participate in that. Uh, it was asked about stages. There's not going to be big stages, but there will be risers for the chorale groups and the music groups. There will probably be three locations um, that will be off the main street, obviously, for that. Um, Music-wise, there, there will be holiday music, not just rock and roll 70s music. Uh, it will be it will be definitely hometown holiday music down at the bell tower, uh, as well as up at at the courthouse when they're performing. Um, I think those were the questions that were asked. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So it seems like I mean, aside from maybe picking a, a backup location for the, the tree. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we have a lot of other issues with this. <laughs> I, I did like the idea potentially of, um, you know, the Veterans Memorial. I don't know if, um, I guess I'd look at Rebecca. I don't know if that would even work or not. I don't know. If, if secured by the tree we're not using. <laughs> could prop it up against the old tree. It's a little snug. <laughs> a little snug, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking possibly about not not where the actual memorial is, but down below where there's the, the paver section. Yeah, yeah somewhere in that. I think kind of behind the bell. But where the bell uh, might be a possibility. I don't know, Terry. Uh, there's a there's a consideration with that, and that is that we would have to get a closure with uh, Caltrans. Uh, because we'd have to close uh, off uh, that short section at Bedford from Highway 50. You would? Oh, because of the light. Yeah, if we yeah, put, because put of the we... tree in the Monument Garden, then we would have people naturally attracted to the tree there, so we'd have to close that road down. Right. Oh, there's always something. <laughs> put it on top of the third floor of the parking garage. <laughs> the yeah, we could, we could stick it up on the top of the parking garage. Yeah, there we go. Like a you could go into this. Giant crane. Mr. Rivas had a suggestion. There are there, Mr. Rivas had a suggestion that there are two trees actually that stick up out of our park, parking garage. You could decorate those. Uh, very good, and the redwoods. So it would yeah. be consistent. It's true. That's okay. Well, perhaps we don't need to actually. <laughs> it might be kind of tough to on the fly to think of something right here, but. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the program as outlined by the Community Foundation and approve the location of the cut tree on the east. No, no. Approve the, where is that option that I want? Number two. Number, number two. two yeah. uh, Options down below is number one. Number oh, one. Right. Approve the location for a cut tree at the front of the courthouse. Yeah. If we can't do that, we might have to come back and look at other brainstorm and yeah. walk up and down Main Street. It's hard, I think it's hard to pick without being out there and looking at things, yeah. but um, that would be my motion. All right. I'll, I second that. Thank you, David. 
All right, we have a first, and I agree. I mean, I think we'll cross that bridge if we have to. And hopefully, I think the courts, I mean, just about getting to the right person, and there's a couple of people we can probably lean into if we're not getting that answer right away. So uh, we'll, we'll pull that lever if we need to. All right, so with that, then, any further comments? All right, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so we will move to item 12.2, uh, which is related, uh, which is the uh, consideration of the downtown central Main Street building exterior string lighting project and find that the project is categorically exempt from CEQA uh, per guideline section 15301 as recommended by the Planning Commission, uh, which was Site Plan Review 2315. And Mr. Rivas has this item for us as, as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, let me start with a little background. The El Dorado Community Foundation um, has secured funding for the installation of what we call architectural string lighting that would outline all the roof lines of the buildings along downtown Main Street, commercial corridor. And if you look at, if you refer to attachment uh, B, in the staff report, the one that the Planning Commission has a very detailed description of the type of lighting and the project area, but it's primarily from, it would be from uh, Sacramento Street to Bedford Avenue. So the installation is to be performed by a company called Light It Up Holiday Lighting of California, and they would be under contract with the El Dorado Community Foundation. Uh, the, building, the building facade string lighting is to be a permanent year-round exterior lighting project with the lights being activated by a photo cell timer and being on uh, nighttime only. The architectural string lighting uh, to be successful uh, must create a balance between lighting and architecture and the main uh, aspects uh, for, for those of us to consider would be uh, the aesthetics, function, and the efficiency of the project. Uh, to get into some of the details of the project, uh, the installation would be commercial grade outdoor string lights on the front facing roof lines. And this would be on all participating buildings along the downtown Main Street corridor from Sacramento Street to Bedford Avenue. Only those buildings with permission from the property owner would be included. Uh, the estimated length of the string lighting is about 2,500 feet in total. Uh, the lights to be utilized are LED warm white C9 bulbs, and there's an attachment A that has the detailed specifications of that lighting. Uh, the lights are to be attached to the buildings by either by magnetic strands, clips, staples, or any other additional atta attachments that are necessary to uh, secure the lighting of the building. The string lights are to be maintained at least twice a year or more as an as-needed basis. The electrical power would be provided by a connection to the city lamp post and would be operated from the photo cell timer. Any existing unpermitted exterior string lighting would also be removed either as part of this project or uh, through code enforcement. And to give a little background on that, it's sort of unfortunate that when the uh, movie that was filmed on Main Street, I think what, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, Christmas, Bloody Christmas, I think was the name of it. I've never seen the movie yet, but it was fun. To, sometimes I would forget that it's not Christmas uh, when I'd go down Main Street and see all the Christmas lights. So they decorated all the buildings, but they left the Christmas lights on the buildings and they did not remove them. So I just want to impress on the council that part of this program is there'd be no cost to the building owner the contractor would remove those lights and then replace them with the, with the white light string lights. So the proposed conditions of approval are contained in your staff report. There are 10 of them. And at this point, staff just wants to apologize uh, to the council and apologize to the planning commissioner. Um, in my haste, I grabbed the draft minutes as opposed to the approved minutes. Uh, that were approved by the Planning Commission. So, but there wasn't a lot of difference, and fortunately, Mr. Morris wanted me to include the conditions of approval in the staff report, which meant that I then grabbed the conditions of approval from the correct uh, minutes. So, uh, but I do want to highlight uh, what those uh, what those changes are. So, um, focus on. 
First, focus on condition number three, where it says the Planning Commission recommends that the City Council limit operation of lights from dusk until 12 to allow for energy savings and night sky visibility. And then there was a second motion later on uh, that's where the, where the Planning Commission then included. The Planning Commission recommends that the City Council limit the hours of illumination to be consistent with Zoning Ordinance Section 10-4-16 and the City Council may find exemption beyond 11 p.m. if the benefit of the project warrants the change. And then going down to uh, condition of approval number 10, uh, basically the Commission was clear that they wanted the installation of the lights shall be contiguous runs of lights with no breaks in continuity as a result of non-participation by the property owners. So with that, uh, staff is recommending that the City Council conditionally approve the site plan review application that was submitted by the El Dorado Community Foundation to allow the installation within the Central Business District zone uh, for exterior architectural string lights outlining, outlining all front roof lines of the buildings for all participating building property owners along the main street from its intersection with Sacramento Street to Bedford Avenue and adopt the findings as recommended by the Planning Commission, attachment A, and then approve the conditions of approval as recommended by the Planning Commission as shown in the staff report and as highlighted by staff. And that concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions you have at this time. All right, thank you, Pierre. I appreciate that um, in walking us through those um, 10 points as well. So thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, for the lights that the city currently puts up, do those turn off at any point in time or do they just stay on all night? So I'm assuming you're referring to the zigzag lighting? Yes. It's yeah. my understanding that those are on all night. Yes. Okay. Correct. And have we ever gotten... It's the same company that puts those up. Yep. As do, with, do, do we receive up. complaints about those being on all night? None that, Not, none that we're aware of. Okay. Other questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I think we should eliminate number 10, the Scrooge Clause, that you know, one person, one property owner on Main Street can, can shut this whole project down. Is, I, I think we can come up with Scrooge solutions. You know, I don't know if we can you know, put up two bars and go over that right. building and, and not touch their building, but I, I, I would hate to see us just eliminate this project for one property owner who who wants to do that. Yeah, I would also say when I saw number 10, I think people who want to put lights should be able to and people who don't want to put lights shouldn't be pressured or forced or feel like they're ruining it for everyone just because they don't want lights on their one property. Agreed. Yeah. That gets down to the percentage issue. Yeah, my, my concern with that is when you have out of state, out of area property owners who aren't getting back to people and you know all sorts of reasons why those property owners just aren't answering you know, they shouldn't have that much say in our community. <laughs> Any other comments at this point? I, I, I do, I agree. I mean, I, I think um, when I saw 10 as well, I was like, mm, that seems a bit onerous because that could essentially kill the whole thing. So we want to make it work. I guess I have a question is so up in uh, the example is uh, Nevada City where all things are uh, old. Um, it looks like all the buildings have lights on them. Did they get 100% compliance from their property owners? Well, that would be, I, I think we should maybe ask that question. Because, because did they just like, like you say, if somebody does and they say screw it, we'll just shoot the lights to the next building and then yeah. yeah. I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know is, what the answer is. I'd like to is. look at the answers and not just, you know, shut it down. No, no, no. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, Mayor, if I may, uh, yep. Steph did meet with a former council member and I think former mayor of, the, of Nevada City. And I directly was asking the question about their uh, architectural string lighting uh, that they have downtown. And uh, she told me that those lights have been up for decades. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And had no idea 
what arrangement was made and how it's really done. So, but I was I was trying to figure out well, how how, how, do, how does another city do it that I knew had these had this uh, lighting. I like light it. it up. The company that puts them up said that they have clients all over in the East Bay and other towns here um, in in El Dorado County as well. Mainly with with uh, their clients are commercial businesses that want outdoor lighting that that are I guess accepted by the jurisdiction. Thanks, Pierre. I love it that Nevada County their lights are in the state of nature or a priori because they've always existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but that, I mean, I, the older city, it makes sense. Um, That's all they got. All right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for public comments. Good evening, Ryan Carter, again. Mona, welcome back. I'm going to try really hard not to give you any work right now. Um, so I'm going to preface my comments by saying a private citizen, speaking in no official capacity, with the disclosure that I am on the Planning Commission. Um, my concern is is that uh, the public was not properly noticed on this. Um, in speaking with Mr. Rivas, I understand that you guys were given both uh, the correct information and the incorrect information. The public was only given incorrect information and still to this point has not been properly given um, the correct uh, recommendation from the Planning Commission. So I don't know if that constitutes anything for the Brown Act as far as notification of the public. We still have not been properly noticed. Um, beyond that, uh, to address the, the, I like that, the Scrooge clause, that's funny. Um, the, the issue was is that we were concerned with having two buildings lit, two buildings off, one building lit, two buildings off, and uh, how wonky that would look. And also the concern, we all know how Christmas lights work, they have to be connected. And so how are you going to get power from those non-participating, across non-participating buildings without running them to the uh, light poles, which are going to be providing the power, and how terrible that would look if every non-participating business forces the city to go to a power pole or to a light pole on the street to get the power to the building. And so take that into consideration. That was the reason we did that, um, was just one for continuity to make not look wonky to have half the buildings on Main Street lit and half the buildings not lit. And also, how do you compel people to get to take power across their roof or can you uh, to maintain the continuity of those lights? Um, also, as far as the um, uh, timing of the lighting, uh, to address uh, uh, Nicole's question, uh, the difference is, is that that zigzag lighting is, is, is temporary holiday lighting. This is proposed to be a permanent lighting fixture on Main Street, thus it falls within a different code section. And city code requires that all permanent lighting fixtures be turned off at 11 p.m., and that's why we did that. Um, we just want the city to uh, comply with their own code and not have a rules for thee and not for me type of situation uh, for the city, you know, well, how can you can have your lights on until midnight, but mine can't be. So anyway, just to address a couple of, of questions and why the mindset was, but uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I came back just to make it clear about the Scrooge idea, because um, I have, to make it clear, I love the idea of the lights. I said more the better, et cetera. But I gave you a specific, a specific example of four properties where the notice didn't get to them. That happens. So I wouldn't assume that you have other people who are not interested. As far as, and, and again, I, I strongly support more lights, great. But you, you, it seems like you might have some liability problems when you start putting things on other people's property without their consent. I can tell you that what those buildings are really old downtown, and we had a property that someone didn't clean out the drain. It almost caused an entire roof, the whole top of the building to collapse, because you know that much water is really heavy. So there's just lots of liability issues, I would think. Do what you want. My interest is the same as yours. I love the town, want it look pretty, but... Um, but, but I think you could just make some more phone calls, check your list. Um, but I wouldn't assume that you have a bunch of Scrooges out there. Uh, missed mailings happen all the time. So that's just a suggestion. Thank you. Oh, I know it's the other subject, but you know, right in front of the, uh, the bell tower, there's a, a lot that's about seven feet wide, 15 feet. Wouldn't that be a good place for a Christmas tree with lights? Thank you, Kirk. Oh, 
Yeah, I don't know what he's been talking about either. But um, Ruth Michelson, and I think it's a great project. I, I saw some of the mock-ups of how other towns have done it, and it certainly sounds really pretty, and I think it'd be a real asset. And to answer one of the questions, of course, no one can do anything to anyone's private property without consent. And we immediately, we do own our building, and we immediately signed on the line and sent it in. And I think 57% is dang good. I know when you all tried to get building owners to comment on formula businesses on Maine, you got like eight responses. So 50 out of, I'm, let's just say there's 100 business owners on that part of historic Maine. That's really phenomenal to get 57%. And there's also been missed mailings, I know, for certain uh, one of the other building owners who owns the, um, Debbie, who owns the Maddie Weggs building, told me that she had to go retrieve hers from the community foundation and that the other building that she rents across the street, Treehouse, that owner never received his. So, you know, we just don't have updated information or whatever. So I agree with Kirk to continue to try. And then the other issue was this thing about keeping it lit late at night or all night or whatever. Why? That is such a waste of energy. Come on, people, carbon footprint. Why? Our, we have a, a town that shuts down, you know, so early. Who do you have? Some people at bars and you want it to be lit up for them? I mean, I really would say 10 o'clock at the latest. I mean, this is in perpetuity. How much energy are you going to waste if you have it lit even till 11 or till midnight? That's really uh, um, criminal. <laughs> That's how strongly I feel about it. Turn off the lights daily and save some energy um, and put them back on at dusk and turn them off at uh, 10 o'clock. So that's it. I really think it's a great project. And I thank the foundation for, uh, for finding the funding for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I'm Kathy Lishman, resident of Placerville. I'm thrilled about this. And again, I thank the foundation. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, who pays for the electricity for the trees on Highway 50? Because I was thinking if the city pays, <coughs> maybe the city um, could start requiring LED lights for those um, because they are on all night. And then I wasn't quite clear of the discussion about the property owners that you haven't heard from yet. I didn't know if there's any who have said absolutely not or if they just haven't been gotten a hold of yet. So I would offer to help get a hold of some that you haven't heard from. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> okay, we'll close public comment and bring this back to the council. Thank you. Okay. For discussion, <clears throat> questions, comments. Oh, I do want to make one clarification. I wasn't proposing that we go ahead and put lights on on the buildings of, no. of the private property. No, that wasn't my proposal at all. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. You know, we have 57% 50 percent to date. I'm sure that we'll get more. Uh, appreciate Kathy's <laughs> offer. I think the foundation should take her up on that and, and anyone else. You know, I think we're all willing to help with those property owners and hunt them down. And because um, a lot of times it is just a, a matter of getting their attention. I think we find that all the time where we want input from the property owners, but it's, it's hard to get. Um, that being said, who? Uh, I have a question. Can we get at least an idea, not right now, but soon, of the property owners that have said yay, how many are contiguous? So how many, like, do we have a block of them? And maybe that was in one of the, is that in the report? No. No, thank God I didn't miss it. Okay, get that information, because I'd be curious to know, because in very, you know, we're kind of anticipating this gap tooth thing out there, but we might have actually a number of properties that are contiguous, and so we, if we could find out that, I think that would be valuable. Then we can go, what do we go? Hunt down. <laughs> Hunt down the other property owners. Yeah, otherwise I'm full. Yeah, if we could just, um, I know on the back of the 
Planning Commission staff report. They've got the APN, you know, numbers and addresses. If we could just get this list highlighted that shows us which yeah. buildings, yeah. that would be yeah. great. Yeah. Um, and that would make it quick and simple. Yeah, got, for all who's the, got what? Who we have to uh, look? Go after. Oh, we have clarification coming. We, have, we do not know the contiguous owners at the moment. Twenty-seven of forty-seven have returned the MOU. No one has said no so far. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification, <coughs> Councilmember Gabbard. Oh, I would just say. I mean, I still think we should get rid of condition number ten, just so that uh, you know. If we do get somebody who says no, that doesn't mean that other people aren't allowed to do it. Because yeah. um, I think people who want to participate should be able to do so. And clearly, we can't force a property owner to do it. So, but but we can shame them into doing it. So. <laughs> yeah, we can find a workaround at that point. Yeah. You know, if there's the one. But to Ryan's point, I, I think it's a good point that you know we don't want like snaggle tooth you know you don't want a bunch of half on half off at that point it doesn't make sense yeah thank you jackie keep it going actually but do we have any further comments uh i think the only other question is on timing for the lights obviously 12 a.m 11 p.m 10 p.m do we want a turn off time I, I, on these lights and what should it be i mean for myself i, I was thinking it should just run with whatever the the, oh. current, the code is like as planning commission laid out. Yeah, yeah. so that's well, that's, 11 that's eleven p.m., which is different than the condition in here, which right. is why I'm bringing it up because we'll need to change it on a motion if right. we're going to go that. Yeah, way. I'm so, I'm fine. Go ahead. So we're really going to dusk to eleven right. p.m. Correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it should be at least. So winter time is going to be longer than summertime. Oh well, in the summer on June twenty first or twentieth or whatever that day is, they'll be on for an hour. They'll be on for like <laughs> an hour and a half. Dusk is almost nine o'clock. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but uh, yeah, eleven. 11? Okay. We'll All turn right. it up to 11. Yeah, I mean, that's that's fine. We're talking about a year round, and I, I like the idea of following our own rules. Um, there's no no other questions or comments. I will go ahead and make an, a, a motion uh, to approve the request with the two modifications that we shut the lights off at 11 p.m. and we eliminate condition 10 and leave that to the common sense of the people in charge doing that. All right, we're going to hear from our lawyer? No, no. Oh, I thought I heard a button. I will second that. Well, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to, and find that the project is categorically exempt pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. That. And that. And that. And that. Thank you. And I'll second that as well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clarici? Aye. Councilmember Gottberg? Aye. Councilmember Yarbrough? Aye. Vice Mayor No? Aye. Mayor Saragossa? Aye. And then we'll turn right. that back over to you. All right. Thank you. After I try to kill myself drinking tea here, apparently. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to our final discussion item uh, this evening, uh, which is item 12.3. Uh, and to review the proposed new banners for Main Street. And uh, Cleve has this report for us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, for many years, the city has had banners we install on our uh, lamp posts downtown. Uh, I did some, some research trying to figure out a couple of things, who, who actually purchased them last time, where they came from, and how far back they go, and, and ran into problems being able to find that information, actually. We believe potentially that the Plasville Downtown Association uh, one time purchased perhaps the last group of banners. <coughs> um, recently, actually several months ago, uh, we were contacted by um, EcoSign, uh, who normally puts those up for us every year that the banners have gotten into such disrepair that they're no longer able to, to put those up. And so we started the process of, of trying to figure out how to get new ones. Uh, uh, former Mayor uh, Kara Taylor and I met with uh, Bill Roby of the Community Foundation, uh, not specifically for this, but to talk about some other things and mentioned this item and he mentioned that uh, the Community Foundation could fund those if, if we would like them to. Uh, we also talked to them and, and br that we then brought an item back to the city council um, actually last March, I believe it was, uh, to talk about allowing them to fund those and also to be able to, uh, they would do the design work for those. Um, unfortunately, 
they got busy, things happened, and, and they didn't ever actually be able to do the design work. So we brought it back uh, as a staff and, and took it on. And in your packet tonight, you have a couple of things. The first page there uh, that shows two, and Dave, if you can, I think, I'm not sure I have this one prepared to put up there. I do have. The, these are what the previous banners were, these two, and then uh, I think if you scroll down or go to the next page, Dave, uh, yeah. These are the two that we have had previously. This is what they looked like last prior. These are the ones that are currently worn out. So I just have a quick question as we're going through this. Is yep. this the proposed color? Because I know we have this nine color. Is yeah. this the recommended color? Well, the color that I uh, that we'll go to for the next ones. Yeah, these are these are the old ones still. Wait, no, these are the oh. no. That's the old ones. Okay, oh, the those are the old ones. Okay, on but my, it is on my paper. They're green. <laughs> well, turn it over. Flip it over. On the back side. But if you look, no, this is the exact one. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, what they were showing is that there's two green ones and two red ones. But you're okay. right. Those, they are the same one. <laughs> okay, but on the new ones, you have burgundy on both sides. On the new ones, we're recommending all burgundy. All burgundy. Oh, that, that's yes. my question. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So then, Dave, if you can go to the next one. Um, this is what we are proposing, and we... Proposed to look at, you know, what what else could we add? We we have the buildings in the bell tower, the other things that we could add and, you know, make some changes. And so you can see what we came up with. We came up with the, uh, the Snowshoe Thompson design, the, the minor design that's well known. The, the, the one on the next page, if you can go to that, Dave, that one is the same as what we currently have that says, but it says, welcome to historic Main Street. And then the last one with the grapes to recognize the, the wineries that are in, in, in the area and et cetera. So trying to pick out some of those things that, that we're, we're known for and that we, uh, that we celebrate, if you will. So what we came up with is those, those four. And the idea was to use the one on the left here that shows welcome to historic Main Street Pass, Placerville. We would only order two of those and those would be put on the, the east end and the west end or the entrances to Main Street. The other banners, the other three banners, we would get equal numbers of those other three, as close as we can to equal numbers. One would have had 10, the other had 11. And those would rotate throughout the, the lampposts throughout the city. Um, so uh, w as noted also with the Community Foundation funding these, um, they requested, and I believe the council agreed back in March that we could recognize them on the banner. So you see on the bottom of the banner is their, their logo uh, recognizing the Community Foundation. Um, so at this time, uh, you also have the proposal from uh, the company that has done these for these in the past, Sierra Display. And you can see the total cost of $4,250 and the number of each banner uh, that would be produced with that. Um, note that there's a setup fee for these. Uh, there's four. So if you change the number, that, but that's only $25. So if you change the number, that could change slightly, but it's not a, not a big, big deal. Um, so that, that's what we have. Um, again, uh, we will soon be putting up uh, holiday decorations on our light posts. So it's my anticipation that these would go up after January 1st when we take down the holiday decorations. So we do have a little bit of time to um, get these done. Uh, I don't think it takes a real long time, but uh, give them some warning and some time to get them uh, put together. So with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Cleve. Questions, comments? I have comments. All right. <laughs> I wanted to propose two more banners, which I don't have exact pictures for. I have rough ideas. Um, right. <laughs> but, you know, we're about a lot of things here in the town, and so I wanted to um, acknowledge our Native American history. And I talked to James down at the museum, and he thought um, basket weaving would be a, a proper one, honoring of our local tribes and what they were about. So. I just picked a basket off the internet, but proposing we work with James and, and the local community to, to come up with that, that right uh, photo for the banner or, or picture for the banner. And then the second one I wanted to do is everyone in the community always expresses such a love for our trails. And so I was looking at a rails to trails type banner. And this design was mostly done by Margie Reed about 15 years ago. Um, 
now I added the tunnel. So she had the, the mountains and the trees and you know it kind of shows the railroad tracks turning into the trail and um, below there's footsteps and a, and a bike and a horse, horseshoe prints, just kind of you know showing the transition from the past to the present. And like I said, I, I found a picture of that tunnel, which I just thought would kind of, yeah. Yes. But this wouldn't be the exact picture because we'd need more of a portrait, um, but we could work for with a local artist to kind of tighten that up to, to something. But those are my two proposals for you all to consider adding. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I like it. Yeah, I like the idea of expanding upon all the things that we are known for yes. and do. And we don't just, we don't exist just for five years. Uh, in the eight, 1850s, so I yes, so I, I do like the idea of celebrating everything that we have past and present uh, in our community. So I, I, I welcome those ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also support the ideas of adding those. I think uh, you know the basket and stuff. It's a great idea to include that to represent a little bit more of our community. Questions. All right, we'll go ahead and open up item 12.3 for uh, public comments, please. Uh, yeah, Ruth Michelson, City Council member. No, thank you. Those were really, really great suggestions. And I actually think that uh, we could use those two suggestions to replace two that were uh, recommended. I'm not really quite clear on the grapes. Um, yes, we have a lot of wineries in this county, but if this is depicting downtown historic Placerville, okay, we have some wine tasting rooms and some wineries, but I, I don't quite get why we would be emphasizing the grapes. And the other is Snowshoe Thompson. We have a big mural of him down at the end of the street at the Thai restaurant. And he just doesn't, you know, I don't know, why do we have two two guys, Snowshoe Thompson and, and the gold panner dude? Um, I think I like this idea of, of inclusion. And I like the idea of nature. Um, I also think the welcome signs, I love those, and I want to have way more than two of them, personally. I'd like to have them throughout town. I like the design, and I like the welcome and that's what we're trying to convey to people that we're so glad that they're here. And so, um, yeah, if we could change the percentage on those. So in summation, I don't think we need Snowshoe Thompson and I don't think we need the grapes. So what, what does that leave? That leaves uh, the welcome, the minor, the trails and the Native American. Thank you very much for you know, expanding what our history is. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Sue Rodman. <laughs> I'd like to add one more, a stagecoach. Stage we have the stagecoach that goes down Maine every, every once in a while, and, and I think that that would be an appropriate thing to put on our, I think that would be better than the grapes myself. So, and I like this idea. I'm not fond of the burgundy color. I'd go with the blue, but <laughs> that's because blue is my favorite color. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, putting up the stagecoach would be a good one. Thank you. Um, Kathy Lishman, there's a lot of things to think about now. Um, if you did a trail one, I think something like that is way too busy. Um, if you're going to do uh, grapes, you should do apples, but neither one of those are really part of the city. Um, Placerville is kind of the gateway to the Sierras. I could see some with just mountains and trees. Um, and I agree with the idea that the Welcome to Placerville, one that shows the bell tower and the, that that could be maybe just have welcome on two ends, but have that um, on some of the banners too, or just the bell tower. Anyway, there's a lot of possibilities. Um, for many years, the city has placed banners on, on light poles 
And Mary Docker, or Doctor, or something like that, she might have been someone who had something to do with the original ones. She owned a shop downtown. Um, and it, it says that in the staff report in the background, it says, for many years, the city has placed banners on light poles in the downtown area to beautify the downtown and highlight the historical nature of the city. I agree. And I love the, um, while the, while the agenda is addressing the new banners, uh, I would like to bring up the banners on parade. And something I have said for a long time, I do not think the back of the banners should have words on them that advertise for something else. I have brought this up in the past. Images of Hope El Dorado is wonderful. Um, I believe in the images of hope and how they serve cancer victims and their families. But that is not, their activities are not in Placerville. And I like the idea that the foundation wanted their logo on the bottom. And I can't believe that the city doesn't have any say about um, the beautiful banners and the back of them. Um, one year they had banners and they had um, Stanley Steamer on the back. And I remember John Driscoll made sure that they got that off. And so I don't think that we need to ignore um, the beautiful banners on Maine. Um, well, they're banners on parade is what they're called. I think that we could request that they not have words on the back and, and advertise for something that doesn't take place in the city. And, and in, um, I know it's not popular because I've gotten in trouble for saying that before, but I do believe that the city could contribute money to it. I had heard originally that they paid $1,000, uh, and I know the people that work with the banners believe in, in what Images of Hope does but I do believe that um, maybe there's another way and they could just have their logo on it instead. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Hello there, Ryan Carter. I'm uh, going to apologize real quick for a slight break in procedure here, Mr. Mayor, but uh, I am disappointed that my question regarding the Brown Act violation on that last item was not addressed. I would really appreciate uh, a clarification on how we did not just violate the Brown Act on that last uh, item. Thank you. Any other, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close public comment. All right, so we got other ideas. I'm gonna fight for Snowshoe Thompson. <laughs> he delivered the mail, Placerville, and, and over the hill for over 20 years and never got paid. I, I, plus, you know, he's just a super cool athlete that was Placerville, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have no problem with keeping Snowshoe. Yeah. Um, I think it's an interest. It's an interesting conversation because, on the one hand, we tend to talk about Placerville as this expansive sort of thing where people come and that. Could, but then, if something is put on the banner that is not exactly in town, I'm going to speak up for grapes. Um, we have several things sort of dedicated to that part of our history that's like in the Gold Rush, and then immediately thereafter, Snowshoe Thompson being kind of one of those characters. And yet agriculture has had far bigger impact on this community over the decades since it actually got going. And actually people grew grapes in town here way back and they just don't now. Um, but it's, a, it's, you know, so we pick apples, but apples, you know, pears were really before apples. Do we want to have a pear on there? Because pears were before apples. Which one is more? The grapes are, if it's the biggest crop in El Dorado County, I mean, by a lot, they grow more grapes. You can't swing a dead cat over yet without hitting a vineyard in anywhere in this county except up where the pine trees are. So I'm going to make a pitch for grapes because I like it. I think it, it's like I said, it's expansive. It recognizes the people around us. I'm good with it. I do have a question, though. Are those three grapes actually going to be a different color than uh, I, I'm than hope, I'm thinking that was maybe our copy. Is, the, machine, is that the copy machine? Sure. Um, <laughs> I like the idea of a, of a stagecoach. Sure. That's a, I like that, and I like the ones. Um, you know, the trail one could be sort of maybe, could be sort of to, to, to sort of outdoor activities, which don't have a, ha happen a lot here. They happen all around us. We're a gateway to the Sierras, but they're not actually here. 
So I think that's a possibility. Possibly, but people really are passionate about our trails. Oh, no, I so. know some per <laughs> one person especially. Um, <laughs> no, the trail's amazing, and I like it. I think that we, if we could actually make it more about the trail that's here, mm -hmm. that would be great. And then it sort of gets into everything else. So, well, The tunnel that we have here the, the on our section of the trail in the city. It, there is a tunnel down there, though. Yeah. It's not but in the trail I'm just yet. pointing out what's I know in what's the city. Tunnel. Well, well you, tunnel. you were just saying, <laughs> make it relative to the city. I know. Um, I, I like um, I like the grapes too. I mean, I, the one they've always been a part of. Yeah. The area. Yeah. Uh, and we're talking about past and present. As well. Yeah. And so yeah. this is a significant part of of Placerville. Um, so I guess the question though is, are we just going to lessen the amount? I, I like all the ideas. I, I like having the eclecticness <coughs> of different things that we're now highlighting. You got me doing it. I know. Sorry. <coughs> I like um, the idea of having the welcome ones. More of them. <coughs> Maybe on bed. I do Bedford too. When you come in, I still kind of like the idea of them welcoming. <coughs> Too many Christmas. What's going on? Um, so maybe a, a few more of those would be good. Yeah, because there's just two right now. I think of the uh, welcome. <coughs> that was the idea. Yes. Yeah. We did four. Just kind of doubled up our. Yeah. Well, we can do as many as you want. That's not. <laughs> no, not just I mean, changing the, the numbers around, yeah. Yep. The the total that we've always had is 34. That's what we're trying to, okay. to, the, to stay the, with. That fits. And gotcha. Stay with that. But other than that, we can mix and match whatever we want to do. Okay. Well, I, I would agree. I, I'd like a couple of more welcome ones. I think that would be appropriate. Yes. I like that idea. Um, but I also you know, want to include the the Native American uh, <laughs> tribute as well as stagecoach and <laughs> and trails. So I think those are all great suggestions. I think you can kind of generally get that with four of the welcome and five of each of the others then. Ooh. If I did my math right. Algebra, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I just did it in my head, so. <laughs> that's about right, yeah, I mean, I, that's correct. Five X plus four equals 34. <laughs> Because you would have you'd have six besides the welcome one, so yeah. six of the, five of those would be thirty plus the four. Yeah, nice. That's See? good. Math. Very good. You get the well done sticker for the right. for the council meeting for I'm the quick the math. Probably the one up here who has to do math in my head for my job. I know it's <laughs> <close>. <laughs> 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 Usually wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to mention one other one that's really significant to Placerville, the Studebaker wheelbarrow? Mm. Uh, Maybe we could have the miner pushing a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> we got four of each. I think we're, we're going to have to get some designs to come back to us and yeah, right. get everything approved. Yeah, I mean, I, it, that might be easier and then just yeah. approve the concept and then yeah. just come back with the final. I, I'm good with this. If staff came up with these, kudos to staff. Yeah, I mean that. Would, yeah, very nice job. Uh, yeah, yeah, they nice. look great. Who needs? Now who we needs have three more them. designs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> come on. We don't never. No one said it was easy. So we could just go that way and just yeah. have them come back as yeah. a FYI, because I think yeah. we'll approve. I mean, we're not going to disprove them unless they look. We're not going to look crazy. <laughs> so we could just do it as a as a uh, file. You file. know, file item right. with the final designs. And we just approve the, um, the amounts. So you're, you're approving, we're going to come back with those, what were there, four more designs now to add to yeah. these? Correct. So that would make For it. approval? Yes. Okay. So that would, yes, yeah, so that would be um, well, four welcome banners and then Snowshoe Thompson, Miner, Grapes, um, wheelbarrow, uh, stagecoach, trails, Native American. <laughs> right. We're not going to get a, a bulk discount. We're no, it'll, it'll be a slightly more expensive. Yes. And, and I'm happy to make up the, yeah, we'll the, the cost difference so it's not a cost. As a I, I've mentioned it to the community foundation. I think they'll be fine with it, but I'll... Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to, to chip in if... Yeah, because we're, we're making changes, so. Um, can I ask a point of clarification? So is the council deferring the approval of the banner design to a future meeting, but approving 
the authorization to staff to enter into the agreement tonight, or do you want to continue that as well? Just continue the whole thing, I would just, say. Okay. Yeah. Just continue the whole thing? Yeah. You might as well do that instead? Yep. That's fine That's with good. me. Yeah. We have enough time, right? Because it's not. this is not till right. 2024, so. Okay, well, let's do that then. Um, okay. So we'll just, do I need to make a motion on to continue it? No. 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 Just, okay, so we're going to go ahead and, and continue this item uh, until next, uh, well, to a later date. I'll put it at that. Okay. Um, item 13 are our council reports uh, from other agency meetings. Um, the first one is Transit Authority. Yeah. So this is the second meeting, the second meeting of the month. So we didn't do Colorado Transit Authority, we didn't do Transportation Commission, and we didn't do Fire Safe Council. All right, we can skip those then. Laf Lafco. No, we, we didn't do Lafco either. All right, SACOG we did meet. Uh, not really. I mean, we had a few four county items. This is our the uh, some transportation items for the four counties that don't include. Uh, El Dorado County, and then we did a tour. Uh, they're doing the SACOG meetings now, kind of regionally every now and then. So we were in the, the chairman, Chairman Patrick Kennedy. Uh, his area is kind of South Sacramento, so we did a tour within South Sacramento, which was kind of cool, different places. that A lot of revitalization yes. in that area, so it was kind of cool. Uh, but nothing that had an immediate effect on Placerville. Uh, Pioneer. Yeah, so we did uh, meet, and uh, I was actually here for that. So uh, we uh, discussed some procedural changes, which will be going out in letters later once uh, everything gets uh, cleared up and the verbiage gets corrected. And we had a presentation on a possible new type of uh, solar program coming out. Um, it was just a beginning presentation. We asked a bunch of questions, and they will be uh, bringing back some answers to us before uh, that gets approved, possibly, and sent back out. Um, and then we got an update on some of the uh, Senate bills that are going through. Um, there's still we've got a few of them that are hanging up, and uh, pretty much uh, the ones that got uh, shot down. So that was pretty much about it. All right, sounds good. Uh, no fire safe council. Uh, opportunity knocks, COC. Uh, we did not meet. Our meeting is next Friday, and currently the draft MNOU is with county council for the temporary navigation center. And then I also have a vehicle abatement uh, meeting tomorrow. Ah, uh, uh, the once a year vehicle abatement. Yes. Uh, hearing. <laughs> we will, yes, thank you. <laughs> I have done that one before, yes. Okay, uh, I will open up item 13 for public comment. All right, seeing none, uh, we will close item 13. Thank you everybody for the updates. Uh, item 14, our request for future uh, agenda items. Any council member have a request? All right, seeing none, uh, will we move on to item 15, uh, which are city manager and staff reports. Uh, I know we will do a receive and file on Chief Cordero's, um, as he's not here, so no one to ask questions of. of. Uh, and then item 15.2 uh, for Mr. Ravas. Uh, Pierre, anything you want to highlight? Sure, the first thing I want to do is uh, thank the council for supporting staff and moving forward with the comp compost procurement program in order for the city to comply with 1383. Uh, we had our uh, grand opening to the general public on October the 14th, that was a Saturday, and uh, was well attended. Uh, we provided you with some statistics and we actually did a, uh, we had a questionnaire that we gave to all the participants. So we had over 100 people that attended the event. Uh, we had about 40 tons of compost that was brought in. Uh, we only have 20 tons left. So I encourage you and uh, notify your friends that there's free organic, certified organic compost that you can use in your, in your garden. So come and get it, it's available. Uh, we had about 90 education bags that were handed out. And again, it's just to encourage the public how to recycle, how to recycle food waste and that sort of thing. Uh, we had four educational booths that were available. So we had, of course, we had El Dorado Disposal there. They're a partner in this. 
Uh, the Master Gardeners of El Dorado County, they had a booth there, the Placerville Garden Club, and the El Dorado Beekeepers. Um, so looking at the overall experience from the questionnaire, uh, we had about 86% that were highly satisfied with the event, and then 14% were uh, felt that the event was satisfactory. We didn't have anybody that went neutral or unsatisfactory, so had a lot of happy customers there. Um, but I really want to thank uh, Nathan uh, Peru with El Dorado Disposal. He's, he's our counterpart over there. He's the sustainability coordinator with El Dorado, uh, El Dorado Disposal. Very helpful in coordinating the whole thing, and he was the one that was instrumental in uh, convincing El Dorado Disposal to provide us with an adequate site. And it's there on Truck Street, Truck and Highway 49 at the Buyback Center. It's really easy to get in. and shovel some compost and get out. So it worked really well. And then I also want to thank um, uh, uh, Natalie uh, Torrencasa and her twin sister, uh, Kristen Torrencasa. They were there and they helped uh, um, man the booths and we had food provided there as well. And it went really well. So thanks to the council again for supporting this. And we hope we have a successful uh, program and provide compost free to the public. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thanks, thanks, Pierre. I just, I'm just heartened that 20, yes, <laughs> and half is gone already. Yeah. So it's always been my worry long. I mean, I thought the first ones would go, I guess, but just long term about, I just envision like mountains of <laughs> fertilizer throughout California that, you know, at some point people are like, all right, we got enough, like, to, you know, keep it. Yeah. So, no, good, great job. I'm, I'm really glad the way it worked out. And I'm especially happy that we were able to find a location that wasn't going to impact city staff. Because that was my other worry, that we were going to have a location that was going to have to have, you know, security or, you know, whatever. And then as a social science experience experiment, I think I'm going to take a couple of shovels and see if they last, you know, or if people will borrow them for good. So we'll, <laughs> we'll you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I wanted to... Thank you for the pictures. For those of us who yes. couldn't attend, that was great to be able to see the event. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so we got a delivery of 40 tons. We got rid of 20 tons. How much more do we still need to get this year? I think we still need to get rid of about, I think this, for for the remainder of, of, of this calendar year and in, in through July of next year, I think we have about, uh, let's see, 150 some tons. So we have quite a bit. Yeah, we need to push it. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are pushing it. Like this I say, is just I 40 think, of 150. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and there's ranches, ahead, so and some of the wineries quick. and stuff, some of the yeah. vineyards. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's available to them as well. So okay. The, yeah, that was we my question. We're away. we're not limiting this to Placerville. We residents. are not. Okay. Anybody can come and take our compost. Come one, come all. Is there public comment on this? Because. Yes, we do have public comment, so we're going to open it up for public comment. Kathy Lishman, and it's almost good night, but um, I was wondering if it was possible for the city to help um, community pride gardeners, if the city could go up and collect some that could be distributed to the different gardens, or if the individual gardeners would have to go and get their own. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. I'm sure we could fi figure something out, even if it's just a couple of us helping out and, and yeah. figuring it out. So we'll we'll work on that, Kathy. That's right. Yeah, you have a truck. Yeah, I, have a, I, I can shovel. And you have a shovel. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll close public comment on that. Um, I did want to. Uh, we we did have a question. I was trying to find the right place to do this, so I, I figured maybe here's the least weird spot to do it. And that was the question in regards to the Brown Act on that previous item. I didn't want to do it in the middle of other uh, items, but since we're at the end of the agenda, if you, um, uh, yes, Mona, if you wanted to make any comment on that, just yes, as happy a- happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was no Brown Act violation, um, which is why the meeting proceeded and I didn't pause the council from deliberations. Um, government Code Section 5954, 5954.2, provides the statutory requirements for the posting and the noticing of an agenda. And that section specifically states that a brief description 
of the item that is going to be discussed by the local agency body must be provided 72 hours in advance. We have done that. We provided 72 hours advance notice and we provided a brief description of the subject matter, which was the string lights. That the two conditions that Mr. Rivas read into the record deviated from what the Planning Commission had stated was important. It was read. The public had the benefit of listening to it. But that one hour disparity of 11 p.m. versus 12 a.m. did not deprive the public of understanding the business that was going to be transacted and discussed. And therefore, there is no Brown Act violation. Okay. Thank you very much. And I know you're very good about stopping me when I mess up. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, upcoming items is item 16, which I will let people read on their own. So at 8.25 p.m., I will adjourn tonight's meeting of the Placerville City Council. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.